Good morning, afternoon, evening, wherever you might be. Welcome to the final day of the Science for Consciousness Conference of the year 2020. And we've really got a treat for you this morning, how or whether quantum physics helps us understand or underlies the mind. So um, my name is George Musser. I'm a science writer formerly an editor at Scientific American Magazine, but now a, a author of two books on fundamental physics. And what I'll do this morning is we'll have four talks of 25 minutes each, plus five minutes of individual Q&A, then we'll have an open discussion at the end. And I'll introduce all the speakers now so that we can keep the logistics moving smoothly from one speaker to the next. Um, for audience members, we invite, we crave your questions. Put them in the Q&A section of the chat window. Don't put them in the chat, that's your back channel. Put them in the Q&A, then vote them up or down as, as per your desire. And then I, during the Q&A sessions, I will basically take the Q&A from the top or near the top of that list. Be sure to indicate to whom you are addressing your question so that I know whom to pose it to. Otherwise, it's all a, a big jumble. So let me start by introducing our, our five uh, panelists. Really, you've got the A-team here of our understanding of quantum physics and the mind. We're going to start with Hartman Nevin, who's an engineer and director at Google, leads the Google AI machine learning project. Uh, very well known recently, of course. Well, always well known, but even more so recently, for demonstrating what's known as quantum supremacy, a clear advantage that quantum information processors have over classical computers. So we've reached kind of a milestone in quantum computing. He will actually with, talk with Peter Reed, who is a longtime uh, intellectual sparring partner of his and, and, and fellow traveler in, in, these, in these thoughts. Uh, Peter uh, is a a uh, partner at Vitruvian, which is a private equity company. He, he works on AI and machine learning kinds of uh, projects. And Hartman actually will be discussing some ideas. If you were paying attention at past TSE meetings, he's going to develop some of the ideas that he had discussed before. Then we have Anita Bandio Padhaya, who is at the National Institute for Material Science in Tsukuba in Japan, a longtime collaborator of our meeting host, Stuart Hameroff, and really the experimental side of the Hameroff Penrose uh, theoretical project. He has a recent book, which he will be discussing some of the content from regarding time crystals. So I'm very much looking forward to that idea. And then we have someone who needs no introduction to this group, Stuart Hameroff, who is the director of the Center for Consciousness Studies at the University of Arizona by training in anesthesiologists and I got to go with him into the operating room earlier this year at the Banner Medical Center in Tucson to see how he does his thing, and that was exciting. And Stuart, if you don't do this, I'm going to ask you in Q&A to discuss how your and Roger's, Roger Penrose's theory stacks up empirically against Giulio Tonini's and, and some of the other projects and ideas that we've seen on consciousness over the years. So the empirical side is really what I'm looking forward to. And our final speaker of the morning before our general Q&A will be Roger Penrose, mathematician, physicist, generally brilliant person at University of Oxford. Among his many accomplishments are the black hole or space-time singularity theorems, developing twister theory, which is one of the approaches to a theory of quantum gravity. Penrose tiles is actually how I got to know the work of Roger Penrose when I was uh, young and trying to get these tiles to, to, to tile our bathroom, wouldn't that be fun? Of course, probably actually by definition impossible. So I would like to introduce first Hartmut, uh, Nevin and Peter Reed for their talk. Um, Hartmut, can you share your screen and let's do this. Yes, good morning. Thanks for the nice introduction. So I think everybody should be able to see my screen now. So, yeah, we would like to present, uh, or we wondered about the question, when are atoms happy? Or to give it a less uh, poetic title, oops. Uh, we can also ask, can 
quantum computers help us understand consciousness. And we would like to acknowledge helpful conversations with a number of people recently have collaborated with Antonio Damasio and his student Kingston Mann, but of course many discussions with Stuart, Roger, Christoph Koch and a long list of others helped us form these thoughts. So um, Hartman builds technology uh, and I invest in technology, so we're both perhaps inevitably coming at this from a technology engineering perspective. And as such, we, we started by asking ourselves, you know, from first principles, what do we need to believe in order to start engineering, building something capable of conscious experience? For example, is conscious experience an observable state of matter? And it's worth noting up front um, that these are questions uh, Hartman and I have been pondering for over a decade. Uh, we're very close friends, longtime Burning Man buddies. Uh, we've been on some rather magnificent adventures in the Amazon jungle together. Um, our style is, um, is quite discursive and uh, conversational, and that's relatively hard to replicate in the confines of Zoom, but uh, we'll do our best. So yeah, with this, um, let's think, how would we construct a theory of consciousness? I think we, most of us would agree that any scientific attempt to explain consciousness is tasked with reconciling the third person perspective of science with our first person direct experience of the world. And a good point of uh, departure seems to be to consider situations in which these two perspectives are correlated. And here I also think we could all agree that behaviors that are conducive to my well being, that is conducive to maintaining homeostasis tend to be correlated with feelings of pleasure while actions that threaten homeostasis feel unpleasant. So uh, eating nutritious food, having a sleep in cuddly blankets or taking a warm shower, good for my homeostasis, tends to feel good. If I hold my hand over a fire, threatens my homeostasis, feels unpleasant. So how can we explain this? Because we would like to confine ourselves to a materialist, physicalist explanation, which assumes there is a physical correlate of consciousness, a state of matter or an evolution of state of matter corresponding to conscious experience. And if that is so, we should be able in principle to find a configuration of matter that is experienced as pleasant. And here's where quantum computers come in. They allow us to better simulate states of matter. Um, we would argue that quantum computers are a new tool for finding the physical correlate of consciousness. Um, it's well understood by now that quantum computing will become an essential tool um, in AI because you can accelerate bread and butter tasks such as optimization. You can represent uh, intricate probability distributions. But a quantum computer is also a programmable physics experiment that allows us to probe the fabric of reality at a more fundamental level. And it may lead to new approaches when thinking about designing a technical artifact that is arguably conscious. So coming back to the question, how can we explain the correlation between pleasant sensations and behaviors conducive to homeostasis? We can think principally of two different avenues of explaining this. One would appeal to psychophysical parallelism. It's an old idea um, where basically you would say you have a system and you conjecture that if the system undergoes certain transformations, those would be experienced in a certain way, for example, pleasant. So we could conjecture that whenever a system assumes a minimum of its free energy, this could be associated with um, feeling good. And it's kind of telling that physicists already use psychological language. You say you relax to a stable state or you move to an excited state. A second explanation would appeal to free will. If there is something like free will, then presumably an agent could use this freedom to assume a pleasant state. And then all evolution would have to do over time is to associate behaviors conducive to homeostasis with states that the agent would like to assume. However, free will is a convoluted um, concept. Oops, there's something missing here. 
Um, free will is a convoluted concept in the sense that people often demand as a necessary condition that even if you were to know the complete reverse light cone of the agent, you cannot predict its next move. However, um, there's the philosophical school of compatibilism, which would say, no, this is not necessarily so. Determinism and free will is not uh, necessarily exclusive. And an example would be, let's say there is a kid that just loves vanilla ice cream. You put multiple flavors in front of the kid, and invariably the kid would choose the vanilla flavor. Then you could say, hey, you act rather like an automaton. Um, I can exactly predict what you're doing. But the kid could rightfully say, so what? I love vanilla ice cream. So because of these complications, uh, we don't quite want to appeal to free will, but to something that can be defined in a more precise way. We want to eke out some freedom in the sense that we say we would like to be, or if it's the case that the agent behavior cannot be predicted even in a probabilistic manner, then this would give the freedom to assume pleasant states. <laughs> By the way, I love the fact that a bird has uh, taken up residence in the Malibu Canyon behind Hartmut and is joining in the conversation. If only we could understand what the bird was saying, probably a <laughs> contribution to this. Um, you will notice that uh, as engineers, uh, we get excited about the potential of a, of a quantum computer as a programmable science experiment. And it's our hope that this new tool alongside the engineering mindset uh, that can, goes with it brings a fresh fresh perspective to this whole consciousness conversation and um, for me at least the beauty of quantum computers is that they solve problems the way nature solves problems rather than the way humans solve problems that's a topic for another time perhaps but our task here um, is to evaluate uh, is consciousness an observable yeah because this would be required to make it a proper um, topic of experimental science. And we would argue uh, with arguments from synthetic psychology that to some degree, yes, consciousness is observable. Consider the following Gedanken experiment where you have two exact clones of a system and the system would, system A is in some state S and hence would emanate some output um, O of S then its clone could see that, could perceive this, and it could reason, oh, if I am outputting O, then I'm in state S, and because I'm the identical system, I can know how A feels. So within limitation, consciousness isn't observable. But this protocol contains a fallacy and you can often see this. We, you see other people saying, oh, other humans are conscious. Say if I see my little boy licking an ice cream and he smiles, then sure, I cannot know the in intricacies of his experience, but I roughly have an idea what's going on. But then we go down from there, we say, oh, my dog, yeah, I think it's conscious. My goldfish, I'm not so sure. And then when it comes to rocks or trees, um, people would often deny them being conscious. But this is really a breakdown of this protocol. It's more a testimony that it's less and less of an observable. And actually, um, Peter and I, we um, fall more into the pan psychist camp. And what we would uh, conjecture in generalization of what uh, Stuart and Roger have always been saying, we think it's a good idea, and it's of course building on their ideas, that consciousness is how a system experiences the emergence of a unique classical reality out of the many. And the generalization here is that all we really appeal to is a decoherence process. And it, this process doesn't have to be brought about by gravitational effects or OR. We think that plain old uh, textbook um, decoherence would just do, do the job. I know that Roger wouldn't agree on this point, but um, it's our view. So you can see we, we end up somewhere in the uh, panpsychism camp where we see consciousness as a distributed feature of the, of the multiverse. 
we're also broadly in the many worlds camp in terms of quantum mechanics. Uh, and we think of consciousness as something along the, on the, along the lines of, you know, what it feels like to select a single classical world from the many worlds. Um, next up, I, I remember us asking ourselves uh, very early on, uh, perhaps somewhat whimsically, how an engineer might set about building a machine that responds to the Buddhist uh, metta or loving kindness prayer, which starts, may I be happy, healthy and peaceful. So, yes, yeah, Peter said in, early on, what we would like to bring to this discussion is, is the engineering uh, perspective and ask the question, is it possible to design animats, we prefer this word over robots, with the analog of, to uh, say it carefully, with the analog of feelings. And now we will go through a concrete three module proposal, how we can achieve this. Um, and we would use our quantum processes um, to be the core of this uh, animat. And um, now I think um, many people in the audience will not exactly be familiar with the notation or know how quantum uh, circuits are constructed. But um, if you run a quantum algorithm, think of it as this sheet music. You essentially have a few qubits. In this case here, every rail would correspond to qubits. So we have five of them and we initialize them, let's say, all in the zero state. So you have a zero, 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 zero state. And then you apply gate operations to those qubits. You manipulate their states in one or two qubit gates. And you do this for a while, again, like music, and then you drive your input state to some output state. And then you measure it. And each qubit um, measured means it would show itself as a zero or one. So you get a bit string out of your measurement. So we do this and we get some string, zero, zero, one, zero, zero. Now we can ask the question, why did we see this state and not another? Textbook quantum mechanics would say, no, yeah, you got essentially a sample from a probability distribution that was encoded by your output state. That's it. So it's a random process. But that's not the whole story. Our experimentalists would immediately say, wait a minute, the rest of the universe had something to do with it. There's noise in the system, maybe a cosmic ray hit. There were some fluctuations in our currents. So it's really partially an open system. So it's more like um, in explanation one, it's as assumed maybe a more stable uh, point as an open quantum system. But there could be yet more um, important to realize is that with the new quantum processes we have, we go to Hilbert spaces of dimensions that humankind has never explored. We are now in the, um, our latest processor has 72 qubits. We will have a thousand qubits in a, um, in a few years. And in there, maybe new deterministic physics or non-deterministic physics that leads uh, to the outcome. And something, so that's an important thing to realize, there could be new physics. So we could see, let's say, triplets of ones showing up or some, statistic, uh, some feature that statistically appears more often than it should. And this could be an effect because there may be as of yet known, unknown, many body forces that would lead to this. And here's maybe an important observation that the program of science would always sort of move away from free will or preference towards adding sort of a new force so, so that you reestablish psychophysical uh, parallelism. Yeah, you, when we see these uh, triplets, uh, for argument's sake, we would not be satisfied with an explanation, say, oh yeah, we see those more often because the system likes to go there. Um, initially, we would think, ah, there must be some noise in the system, and we would uh, try to understand this. If we can't explain it with noise, eventually somebody will come along and say, yeah, there must be an unknown many-body force. So new physics could happen in high-dimensional Hilbert space. But there is something else that's important to realize here, and that was actually somewhat of a revelation leading up to this talk, that the output of this agent cannot be predicted, not even probabilistically. We all agree that this individual string, this textbook quantum mechanics, um, you would, yeah, it's a, a sample from probability distribution. 
But if you want to probabilistically say which output um, you would get, the quantum um, supremacy demonstration that we did last year, essentially a lesson from this is it's impossible. If you, there's no classical computer that has a memory space or the time to write down or compute the table of probabilities for the different outcomes. And the same would be true even if you had a quantum computer. A quantum computer never gives you access to the full uh, wave function. It only gives you access to samples. So you would have to construct the probability distribution from individual samples. Again, this would take you more memory space and more uh, time steps than available in the universe, even at modest sizes. So, so a few hundred qubit um, agent cannot be predicted. Um, so this goes back to the free will piece. So that's maybe something important to realize. And with just mild assumptions, if there's just enough coherence in living systems that would mimic this somehow, then we would also settle once and for all the question, in principle, can the behavior of a living system be predicted, even probabilistically? The answer is no. So the next state would be, so we, we, the first module was about finding a happy place. And, oh, sorry, I forgot one piece. Um, this is sort of the outer loop. So once we see that there is a certain state coming out, we would say, okay, we cannot really discriminate whether it was the noise, whether it was um, some freedom the system had, or whether it was just textbook quantum mechanics. We won't try to disentangle this. All we will say is, okay, fine, for whatever reason, you seem to like to come to this state. So let's support the system by tuning some free parameters or setters here in the, in the circuit, such that the next time you run it, it's a little bit more likely to get to the same state. Then we run it again, you see another state, we say, oh, you seem to like the state too. So let's dial our setters again so that in the next round you're a little bit more likely there. And you repeat this, let's say, a million times. Then arguably the quantum state that emerges from this process is a quantum state that has support on classical outcomes that we have seen before and that we would argue are possibly perceived as pleasant by the system. And then in the next stage, we will try to uh, stabilize those happy states. We will use the methods of quantum error correction uh, to do so. Quantum error correction actually is a process of stabilizing a quantum state and can be seen as a homeostatic loop. In here in this example, let's say we have a state alpha zero zero plus beta one one one, and we want to uh, stabilize this. Let's say there is a cosmic ray hitting in um, quantum error correction. You have to, of course, be a bit sneaky. You cannot just measure each qubit and say, hey, has the cosmic ray flipped you? Then you would collapse the logical state. You have to be uh, a little bit roundabout. And what you do is you measure um, pairs of qubits or uh, quadruples, and you look at their parity. Because if you just look at the parity, then you cannot discriminate between um, the logical states. Yet if the parity flips, you can infer, oh, an error must have occurred. So the essential elements for a homeostatic loop are in place. You have interoceptors, which are these parity measurements. Then you have a controller, which can interpret the different parity measurements and then can infer, oh, this qubit was flipped, let me correct it. So you have an effector. So what you have here is a homeostatic loop. And what it does is it serves for the system or for the agent as a check on self-integrity, but because it's a quantum system, it can operate as a Heisenberg limit. So it can be the most sensitive probe to self-integrity that you can possibly build. And we can see this in our lab. If the air condition fluctuates a little bit, there's a little bit of um, uh, fluctuation on the power grid, immediately our system would throw more um, parity changes and would give us an alarm, hey, something's wrong here. So it's a very sensitive system checking on its self-integrity. And then the last piece, we could marry the mod two models we had with, let's say, a cortex with a learner. Yeah, so roughly we think that the construction of the happy state that in the living system were to must happen on a subcellular molecular level. So the homeostatic engine around it, um, this 
could involve other organs. And then sort of a cortex you would layer on top um, as the learner. Five minute and, warning, Hartman. Sorry? Five minute warning. Oh, and we have to go rather quickly. So yeah, the um, important piece here is that we now have constructed um, experimental platform that would allow us to think about these things in an experimental way. We could, for example, ask a learner with no homeostatic engine, how well does it perform? A learner with a homeostatic engine that stabilizes a happy state as in module one, how good is this? Or does the quantum state at all matter? Um, would it be as good if the homeostatic engine just um, stabilizes a classical state? Right, so we, we think we can, in principle, build a machine that knows how to find and maintain a happy place and therefore satisfies what some people call the Anna Karenina principle. Uh, we like Tolstoy's observation that all, fa all happy families are alike. Each unhappy family is unhappy in its own way. In other words, for a family or a machine to be happy, it will have to succeed on several fronts. And if any one of those is missing, it'll be unhappy. Um, to, to visualize this, imagine that happiness is a point uh, or clustered around a point surrounded by a vast space of unhappiness. Uh, we'll come back to that. Uh, the next question was to check how such a machine stacks up against uh, the leading theories of consciousness. So, if uh, Roger and Stuart would look at the machine, they would say, hey, you guys, every time you measure the qubits during an error correction cycle, you collapse them. So actually every 10 microseconds, about 500 qubits um, get measured for one logical qubit, which has about a thousand qubits. And so this, in regular cycles, we would bring about orchestrated bings to use Stuart's language. And you're entitled to think, oh, this collapse came really about by OR. Yeah, you would have to admit there was orchestrated conscious moments. But we think that gravitational reasons for collapse are very um, weak. We actually calculated this once. For our qubits, uh, the decoherence channel would still leave a lifetime of 10 to the 29 seconds. So this is vastly longer than the 10 microseconds of coherence time that we actually observe. Um, if you talk to the IIT people, they would have to say, oh, there is really no way to cut your system um, such that it separates almost or neatly into subsystems. So the, the quantum circuits that we used in the quantum um, supremacy um, demonstration were actually deliberately made such that it's never possible to um, subdivide uh, the system because we wanted to have fastest possible entanglement spread. So the IIT people would have to look at the system and say, wow, this is a very conscious system. And last time I talked to Christoph Koch, he said, and probably many of us would agree, the only real way to assess consciousness by self-reporting. And we can do a cheesy move here and say, we can give our system the ability um, to have to self-report. We can use a known machine learning technique, which is called an embedding technique, and we can essentially take sort of the um, measurements from our homeostatic engine, essentially the um, check where you are in state space, and map them or embed them into a space of English language words that describe feelings. And then by the, the Tolstoy um, or Anna Karenina principle, what we conjecture you would see is that whenever you are close to the fixed point, whenever you're close to the attractor, um, you would probably um, associate this with positive valence terms, such as happy content. And if the system is far away, so it's destabilized, you would probably see um, embedded uh, terms there like alarmed or anxious. It's possible at least in principle, to build a robot whose behaviors are not predictable, uh, may be conscious, and may have feelings which it can tell us about um, what could possibly go wrong. Uh, we ethically, we obviously have to tread very, very carefully here. Uh, another way to frame the conundrum is this, for me at least, do you, do you want an AI that's controllable 
or do you want the best AI? Uh, and just to personalize that or visualize it, I think I would prefer to sit in a self-driving car that is scared to crash and is instead looking intrinsically seeking a homeostatic, happy outcome. So yeah, obviously the, this is a theoretical proposal and we are um, keenly aware of the, the ethical implications and have to tread carefully here. Um, but then to wrap this up, from an engineering perspective, are there reasons to think why an artificial general intelligence with an integrated homeostatic engine could perform better? We think yes. And one argument is simply a self-consistency argument. You see more stable systems or systems transient towards a stable state than you see unstable systems. So if you run into a pendulum and typically hangs downwards, you hardly ever see it upward. And a system that is concerned about its own stability is ultimately a type of system we will see more of. So in the very, if you take the long-term view, um, these ought to be the systems that will be around more. But then there are many just very tactical, technical machine learning advantages. We have lists them here. Um, we uh, won't have time to go through them all. But the important thing is we have now an experimental platform where you can ask these questions, as I um, uh, said before, whether indeed um, an in integration of a learner with a homeostatic engine that stabilizes a quantum state with certain features, you know, our happy state, is this an advantageous learner? And with that, we're done. Thank you very much. Wonderful. Let's give our speakers some virtual applause. Thank you so much, Hartman and Peter. Um, so we have a couple minutes for questions. And one question that came up is, how would you go about engineering the subjectivity as really even a precursor of, of feelings and thoughts? So where's the subjective or conscious element coming into your system? Yeah, so I may take this question. The, the important piece um, to realize when I say it, you cannot predict the output of this agent or you cannot predict the behavior of this agent this is true even if the initial state can be exactly reproduced and the environment, so the boundary condition and initial conditions, you would be completely in control of. You know, this is different from, oh, I cannot exactly reproduce it um, and therefore I cannot predict it. No, um, the statement here is stronger with exact initial and exact boundary condition replication we can talk about whether it would run against the no cloning theorem. In this case, you still would not be able to even probabilistically predict uh, the output. The individualism would come in that this random walk that the system would do after you have um, measured it for the first time and now you uh, change the, the, the setters to reward it or support it going to the uh, happy states um, again this would be for every system um, in a separate uh, trajectory. So each system would have an individual um, life trajectory that would typically not be shared by any two agents. So we have um, just a minute and we actually have a couple questions regarding some of the other projects that you've done. So let me see if I can take one that connects to the current one. If these, if the output of the system and also of the, the kind of supremacy calculation you did earlier is unpredictable, then what engineering advantage do these have? You've talked a lot about the engineering advantage of the homeostatic engine, but what's the engineering benefit of having an unpredictable in principle system? Yeah, this is just sort of the extreme case to um, they can make certain proofs. Of course, the interesting circuits will have some structure. So you don't, I mean, perfect or certifiable random numbers is actually a commercially relevant service. You need this for making good passwords, but that's besides the point for in the robotics or um, machine learning concept context, we want circuits that are beyond classical yet have interesting structure. Wonderful. So we will get back audience members to some of your other questions. I have about 15 in my box here 
and I'll feed those to you, um, Peter and Hartlett, um, in the general session. So let's again thank our speaker and move to Ani's talk. Ani, can you share your screen? Shall I start? Yes, please. Well, thank you. Yeah. So, uh, so I would uh, uh, today I would like to talk about um, artificial atoms. Uh, uh, we all know atoms. We are very much uh, aware about materials, objects, and uh, information. What we have been working uh, with uh, is trying to build. Uh, material structures or information structures made of artificial atoms. Artificial atoms, to understand um, what could be artificial atoms, so uh, more than, uh, I mean, nearly 200 years back, uh, vortex atoms or artificial atoms were proposed. So they are actually made of field, say, imagine electric field, high density electric field um, uh, builds a um, ring. So that ring could work as an atom and then many such rings could come together and then they build up a superstructure. So you can't, you can't touch it. You can't, um, you can't uh, feel it. But what would happen is it can do some work. For an example, optical vortex. Uh, magnetic vortex. So they can do work, but you can't feel it. So the materials vibrate and then they generate these kind of atoms under all vortex. So uh, this is the book that I have written uh, and it's a compilation of our 15 years of research work. And I personally think, and uh, in my group, uh, there are several people we are, on whom we have worked. So we think that uh, the problem is not about, uh, it's a uh, quantum computing that will give the answer to consciousness or a classical computing. The question is very different. What is the fundamental language in nature? And how the information is integrated? What is information? How does it integrate? So that the temple-like architecture that you were seeing here is actually a simple mathematics where we take one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight different events, and then we try to arrange them in a way. Imagine there is some controller of the universe and uh, he is very stupid. And then he is taking random events and putting them together. And then they try to arrange the events. Then how he will do it, how we figure it out. So this is the core computing structure of self operating system. So we think that if you follow the root of algorithm where you can write a statement one by one, then you can never build a conscious machine or two intelligent system. A self-operational system should, uh, should have an engine. Uh, to our case, it's the fundamental number system. So number system gives rise to this kind of temple architecture. This temple architecture gives rise to vortex atoms. Vortex atoms bring together topology in, in geometric language, different matters, and then implement life and other expressions of whatever we are saying. So that is the whole core idea that on based on which we did our 15 years of research. And then I will summarize a bit of it here. So how does even events grow in nature? So this is the very fundamental question we need to answer. So when we do Turing based machines, be it a quantum computer or classical computer or, or any algorithm based systems, then we consider that events grow sequentially one after another in the universe. That's how it happens. We disagree with it completely. So the whole book and the whole thesis is events grow within and above. So you take one event, you go inside, you find more, you find more, you find more, and it goes on. So it's undefined uh, uh, in, the, in the present scenario of uh, Turing tape or others. So, uh, so let's, uh, in, in the year 2008, uh, a paper came out in Nature, and that paper was about fourth circuit element, a missing circuit element for 150 years. And then they said they took a semiconductor-like structure and they built it. I was very 
upset about it. I wrote the nature editor that this is this is this cannot be right. This is very very wrong. A semiconductor like structure cannot correlate charge and the flux of the or the, or the vortex atoms. And then I was looking for some material somewhere uh, that should be closer to the fourth circuit element. And then I searched and searched and searched, and then I found microtubule-like structures could do that. And then I was looking for, uh, um, I never heard the uh, name of, um, uh, of Stuart Hamidoff, and I didn't, didn't know that Roger Penrose and they also work. But when I uh, was looking for this kind of material, I thought nobody has even thought about it, that a, this kind of microtubule, this kind of structure could be responsible for consciousness. And then I searched, 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 and then I came, accidentally I came, I came to, the, to a chapter of Stuart Hameroff. And I came to know that Stuart Hameroff and Roger Penrose, uh, more than um, 15, to, uh, 15 years back, they, they, proposed, they have already taken this material and proposed that consciousness is based upon it. I was extremely happy and we started working on microtubule uh, to understand. So this is a tubulin protein, a protein structure that uh, 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 spirally self-assemble and build the uh, um, uh, microtubular structure. And if we go, uh, and this is a journey through the microtubule. So uh, you can have um, um, uh, charges or the or the defects moving moving around it, and uh, and uh, and there could be a um, ring of fills that can pass through or the vortex atoms it can hold. So uh, we can build an equivalent circuit uh, checking the spirals or alpha beta helices, and then we can model it. And with uh, quantum tunneling images of the single tubulin protein there at different um, electromagnetic frequencies. What our fundamental contribution or fundamental finding is that normally, normally, I repeat, normally in the, when you look at quantum systems, you look at a particular material and pump some light or pump some electron or coherent electrons or sources and try to see whether they are entangled or not. This is a quantum tunneling image. What we found in biological material uh, and uh, microtubule especially is different electromagnetic signals you have to pump, specific frequencies at different, different time domain you need to pump in the system and only then only then you get this kind of quantum behavior. We reported this kind of anomalies in 2010, 2011, 2012 for the first time. Only currently we see abundance of nature papers are coming up in the last two, three years, 2018, 2019, 2020, when people are taking inorganic materials, pumping electromagnetic wave and seeing the quantum effects, quantum entanglement and all these things at room temperature by pumping electromagnetic wave. But we reported similar kind of things many, many years back. Let's try to see why does it happen. So we found, uh, we took artificial uh, tubulin protein and then we tried to, this is a theoretical simulation. And we found that magnetic field is actually oscillating between the two, tubulin, two, two, two part of the tubulin protein. And then we found that the electromagnetic resonance frequencies, electromagnetic resonance you, you all know, uh, I mean, it's, it's, it's more than a century old. So if you, if you take a material and you pump electromagnetic field, it acts like a cavity, just like a flute, and then electromagnetic wave oscillates resonantly inside. But if it shifts its phase, then you can plot it in terms of a sphere, where you have many, many different periodic oscillations. They come together and forms a clock. So this is called time crystal. Time crystal concept came in the 1970s. They wanted to, un wanted to explain the self-intelligence of a virus. Now people are thinking about a coronavirus now worldwide. How come for the last 18 years, coronavirus is able to pass through different animals and evolve itself towards a perfect bonding structures, AC2 protein and then the spike receptor. How did they do it? But this question was actually asked in the 1967. And then they came up that with a few molecules, how could they build up massive incredible intelligence? Then they said that there are many periodic clocks and they come together, they self-assemble, and then thus they build the intelligent systems. So that is how time crystal uh, or clock concepts came. And in, uh, So 
So let's look at one video. So if uh, integers are there and then different options are there and you, we rotate them. So taking different symmetries, we can self assemble the clocks and then the clock structures or clock ar architectures uh, could form. And uh, if we think of information structure then, then a clock could be a sphere and on that sphere, there could be a, um, uh, a line, a circular line, and there could be singularity points at three points, then we can get a triangle. So this is the fusion of geometric shapes and the resonance oscillation. So someone, some element is resonantly vibrating, and then if there is a phase singularity, you can self-assemble it into a superstructure. And we can map the whole microtubule and different different biological systems with the architecture of clocks or time crystals. And we can, we have modeled and published the whole human brain. So we have taken each and every component for the last 12 years and then founded the clock. So 537 different classes of clocks we mapped. So more than 40 students have worked for the last 12 years. And then we intricately mapped every single component, brain component we have taken, theoretically we have found, and then matched with the, the experiment and then, then build up this time crystal structure. So time crystal movement actually started in the 1970s to map all the clock architectures into a multi-dimensional scenario. And then we did it theoretically. And, and some of the cases, microtubule, tubulin protein, neuron, in these cases, we publish the experimental results and the rest of the things are theory. And uh, so we try to um, perform classical experiments. Classical means I'm saying classical way of doing interference measurement uh, to understand the quantum behavior at a different electromagnetic frequencies. But we found the fractal resonance. If you take a resonance peak and you split it up, you find more resonance peak inside. The geometric fractal behavior was there. And then we discovered also in the tubulin protein and in, in microtubules, the magnetic behaviors. We carried out uh, spin-based backscattering um, uh, geometric images in, in SNBOS. It's a standard tool uh, on the microtubule to understand that uh, magnons form on the microtubule. And then magnetic vortices were coherent. And then the most interesting part, that is, this is a DNA molecule, and then we switch on a particular frequency and we can vanish it quantum mechanically. So this is quantum tunneling images and raw data, absolutely raw data from the machine. We pump a frequency, we vanish it, and then we were, we were trying to do that similar thing on microtubule. And uh, we found that in kilohertz, you, can, you would see microtubule like that. In megahertz, you observe the proteins, but the most interesting and exciting thing is that at particular gigahertz frequencies, you vanish the whole microtubule and you observe only the water. So you can selectively vanish in the quantum domain, whatever the component you want. So three different key components, kilohertz, gigahertz, and megahertz, and then you can, you can vanish whatever you want. What is the advantage of it? Advantage is quantum cloaking helps to see the desired one in the forest. So even if neurons, uh, are, neurons are randomly oriented in the, in the brain, but what you can do is with microtubule bundle and they can see each other far distant because microtubules get vanished in a particular frequency, totally disappear. So vanishing or cloaking was well known in electromagnetism, but in quantum domain also this happens. We got an experimental evidence. So you don't need to build a junction-based circuit. You can 3D orient the samples and then you can get it. So we created atoms. I talked about, I started my presentation with atoms, uh, optical and uh, um, um, magnetic. So these are green are actually atomic assembly coming out from the microtubule. And the red are optical vortex assembly. So optical field, electric vectors are forming a ring. So optical vortex, you know, two years back for, uh, for the invention of optical vortex, Nobel Prize was given. So it is uh, optical vortex or these vortex atoms or artificial atoms and assembling them. Is a, is a biggest sensation now all over the world. But that could be used for a very advanced information processing. And we have built a computer. We are building a computer uh, that we think would be um, human-like. We can't say conscious, but human-like. But they will process information like, like this way. So the 
So the, how the atoms look like, I'm showing it here, and we built a Hamiltonian to solve uh, the structures. So there are 12 different holes on the phase space which are bridged together to build this kind of atoms. So microtubule is very, very efficient to build these kind of things. And then we created artificial analog microtubular structure to build these kind of atoms, assemble them, and build uh, the clock-like architectures. So these are the standard quantum uh, entanglement experiment. So you pump a blue laser with a BBO crystal, you divide it into two laser parts, and then you put a microtubule, one microtubule sample here, one microtubule sample in the other side, and you electromagnetically you pump both of them at a particular resonance frequency. And you can carry out Bell's inequality and other experiments at room temperature, and you can demonstrate with the coincidence counter the quantum entanglement uh, uh, phenomenon. But quantum uh, experiments are happening on the vortex atoms, artificial atoms, they are entangling. Who are entangling? The vortex atoms. So you have to understand that. So these are many different kinds of results with the different, different channels for quantum entanglement experiments. So how these vortex uh, self-assemble, these are the kind of a very simple analogy that um, uh, vortex atoms have this kind of ring-like things and then they come together and assemble and give condense to give you the conscious experience that you are seeing. And um, uh, this is a real-time uh, systems. When they blink and they process the vortex atom, how the when the computing happens in a large assembly, how does it look like? So these are small, small, tiny, tiny magnetic channels. So that was a presentation I, I gave. So they, that actually is the 12 dimensional um, mathematics. I would not like to get into that. Um, so basically we are writing a series of books um, to summarize uh, different kind of neuroscience work that we did to understand because we, I, today I gave a brief presentation about different kind of vortex atoms and how they come together and they assemble to give us the conscious experiences that we see and with a geometric language, but we have done not only work on microtubule, we have done work on the four circuit element, the neural behaviors, we have a major part, I am in a material science institute, so whatever I'm saying, we create artificial molecular systems, artificial organic jelly, to implement uh, the principles that we learn from microtubule and to build an artificial brain-like structures. Thank you. Wonderful, thank you so much. So that leaves us um, actually about 10 minutes for questions, which is a, a good amount of time. And I think it would, it, would be, it would be interesting just for me personally, but the audience might like to know as well, if you could talk a little bit more about the time crystal, what is the idea and what does it mean? And then how does it come into your own work? Ah, so uh, time crystal idea actually uh, came in the, uh, in the 1960s, as I said that uh, people wanted to understand that how few molecules, uh, only uh, four to five nanometer to 10 nanometer diameters, only few, few molecules, they form a virus. And then the virus can replicate, self-replicate. It can go from living system, one living system to another system to another system and evolve and then build, outperform the massive uh, uh, immune system that we have in our body, how, how the intelligence are coming. So they say only clocks coming together. For an example, um, if I think um, um, uh, our conscious experience when I'm talking, it's a 200 milliseconds clock. Every 200 milliseconds, my conscious experience is generated. For that to happen, a, a neuron is firing every millisecond, one millisecond, tick, tick, tick. For that to happen, microtubules are vibrating every microsecond one, tick, 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 tick. But for that to happen, there is a clock inside, millions of clocks inside of tubulin protein. They are every nanosecond, tick, 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 tick. But for that to happen, it will go secondary structures every picosecond, tick, 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 tick. But for that to happen, you can go to the functional groups. They are vibrating in the femtoseconds, tick, 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 tick. So clock inside a clock inside a clock inside a clock inside a clock. So these kind of nested clock architectures are, you can consider it as a 
as a as a as a as a time crystal because you have uh, you have a clock you have a you have a clock and then you, it repeats itself just like atoms so so you can consider um, a time crystal as an assembly of clock architectures so many many periodic events that are happening around us controlling together but because suppose you have a clock architecture and then the clocks are running then the output of the system if the clocks run continuously the output of the system would be would be natural but what a living system can do for its conscious experience is it can add new clocks and it can delete some of the old clocks so when new clocks come in and the new old clocks go there is one very particular thing that is geometric constants so how can you bring the clock and how can you take it away and what are the symmetries of the arrangement of the clocks so breaking symmetry i do not want to get into detail because that is a little bit difficult physics but um, but breaking symmetry is and 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 rejuvenating new symmetries uh, uh, coupling different kind of symmetries grouping them and then isolating them that is how it goes and who runs that that is the pattern of primes in nature so we found that microtubules when they are assembling their resonance peaks they assemble in a pretty particular way triplet of triplet doublet of triplet triplet of pentate doublet of triplet, doublet so this kind of unique unique composition of primes prime number of resonance peaks come together and do together that's the reason for four years our research output was almost zero we could not we could not figure out how could microtubule and why microtubules are actually changing the the resonance peaks and shifting the time and grouping different kind of vibrations together later we came to understand that it was the composition of clocks that was that was helping it or the or the combination of symmetries that was helping so i mean if if that helps no that that's a huge help thanks and that clarifies also for me the connection to the microtubules so in the uh, Q&A box, we're also getting some questions regarding some of the other basic concepts that you introduced. And I'm wondering if you could go back to quantum cloaking and clarify what that exactly is. Ah, so uh, quantum cloaking was proposed in 2006. Uh, normally classical cloaking, classical cloaking means I'm standing here and then I will, uh, I will turn invisible. So that is called classical cloaking. Invisible means you can see the backside the whatever is in the back so the light from the back comes and then covers me and then comes to the front in such a way that you see the back side and then uh, i am i become invisible so that is classical cloaking quantum cloaking is a little bit different in quantum cloaking the same thing will happen it will be invisible but in the quantum domain in the quantum domain means a wave function always uh, penetrates through a material. So it does not hop. So classically, uh, if I have a barrier, uh, if I have a barrier and I want to cross it, classically what I have to do, I have to get a more energy to jump over it. But quantum mechanically, to jump over or cross over, this kind of idea doesn't exist. So what happens, I may, this is a barrier, big uh, wall, but to cross over to go other side, I do not need more energy. I do not need to jump the wall. Even if I have a um, lower energy, I, I strike on the wall 10 to the power 22 number of times per second. Then after some time, you will find me on the other side of the wall as well. So that is the kind of high frequency when oscillations are there, then their probability increases to go other side. So that is kind of a quantum, quantum mechanics uh, when it comes in. And quantum mechanically invisible, then what does it mean by that? It means a set of wave functions, a set of wave functions. Now imagine one wave function can go from one side to another. That is called quantum tunneling, we all know, for many, many years. But imagine all the wave functions that I have in a set of atoms, collection of atoms, all of them penetrates through the wall and go to the other side. That is magical. So that's why 2006, this proposal, when it, it first came, it created a huge sensation that is it, will it be really possible to ever realize such a thing? Because if you can do that, what does it mean? It means an object. An object means a big object with all its information content could be transferred to the other universe, to the other universe 
without any effort, with, with complete information content. That means lot of atoms, lot of wave functions together, and then all their dynamics go to the other side without any loss. So that's why it was called a science fiction when it first proposed in 2006, and a lot of very good theories came out. But when we first saw it, we couldn't believe our eyes that in front of us, in front of us, it vanishes. So we, we, we could see, um, so the wave function is actually, uh, uh, STM is there, um, and then uh, uh, in the between microtubule or DNA molecule or some other molecule, and then on other side, we take a wave function or, or the atomic surface, so atom images. So on the back side of me, say a lot of atoms. And then suddenly all those atomic integrated information passes through me and comes to this side. I know this is unbelievable, but, <laughs> but in quantum mechanics, such things happen. But until 2006, until 2006, it was proposed, uh, we are not the, not the group who proposed in 2006. Uh, since 2006, many, many, many groups have, have, have worked on it. Until 2006, quantum mechanics meant one wave function would go from here to there, only one, not a group of wave functions. So when we say quantum cloaking, that we clearly say that a group of a very complex composition of wave functions keeping their symmetries intact passes the barrier, which is much higher energy than that element. So that is very simply what quantum cloaking is. So if I understand you, quantum cloaking is kind of quantum tunneling on steroids. It's quantum tunneling of multiple wave functions. Multiple and say your whole body transfers through. Um, because you are a quant uh, at the molecular scale, we, we all the molecules are quantum mechanical. I mean, molecules are molecular complexes, so quantum mechanical. So whole whole microtubule goes from this side to that side. <laughs> wow, it's really astounding. So it's, we also that's why I say you don't have to believe it, but it <laughs> well, belief and, and acceptance are two different things, I guess. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. the a uh, number of questions have come up regarding, and I'll synth try to synthesize them, regarding the experimental signatures that you see. For instance, are these high frequencies that you see related to EEG frequencies or what other tangible, even clinical relevance uh, do mm -hmm. some of these uh, processes yeah. have? Yeah, so, mm, uh, so we, uh, we present here today because vortex atom, because uh, the topic of this uh, session is quantum mechanical. So we confined ourselves within tubulin and microtubule and then the related quantum mechanical data. But we did the experiment on neurons and we have published a series of papers we have. And uh, also neuron assembly uh, and also the EEG, EEG data will be published very soon. So we have look at the frequency spectrum and we have built the time crystal for the EEG data also. And we have, we have seen the triplet of triplet symmetries that we observed in the microtubule and in the tubulin protein and the neuron. So this year also we published a paper where we showed that scale-free scale free behavior. So triplet of triplet, grouping of clocks. Three, take three clocks, form a group, and then take three such groups and form another group. So triplet of triplet, so this is called nine clocks. You can make three groups and then three of three, so nine. So this is the grouping behavior of clocks. You can see it in a single tubulin protein. You can see it in a microtubule. You can see it in neuron. You can see it in neuron cluster. You can find it even in the EEG spectrum. So at many different places, this kind of, this kind of uh, uh, grouping of primes behavior observe, uh, were observed experimentally. So tangible thing means the EEG spectrum, when you will, will check the, in the frequency domain and shifts its phase, phase shift of the, of the different you know, alpha, beta, gamma, delta, the, the frequency peaks that you observe. When you, when you see their shift, you will find a triplet of triplet grouping behavior of different frequency peaks are there also. But long before us, uh, long before us, and Gregory Busaki and then others, uh, they try to compile and then they have already, they already uh, published. They didn't say triplet of triplet, but they, they published the frequency groups and then they showed that three of three grouping are there. So what we see in the microtubular scale or the molecular scale or the atomic scale is actually transcended in, 
the extreme expressional behaviors of a human conscious being. So thank you so much. I'll hold off on some of the other questions until our general Q&A. Let's thank the speaker again. And Ani, you can just imagine there's a roar, virtual roar of people applauding you at this moment, even if you can't hear uh, directly. And especially since it's the middle of the night for you, we appreciate your time that you've spent with us. Um, so Stuart, are you, are you ready to go here? Okay. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Uh, did you want to uh, share your screen or? Uh, we're sharing the screen now, I hope. Beautiful. And it's, uh, it's great to be here with you and some of my best friends and colleagues around the world. Good to see you guys. The pleasure is ours. <laughs> uh, we're trying here. While Stuart is bringing that up, let me just remind our audience members, please put your questions and upvote them in the Q&A box. I do look at the chat box, but that's more complicated. So I'm relying more on the Q&A box. Thank you. Okay, do you see my screen? Yes. Okay, testing ORCOR. ORCOR is orchestrated objective reduction. It's the theory of consciousness that Roger and I developed in the mid 1990s, and it's still going strong. I would say stronger than ever. And I'm gonna talk about how to test it and claim that it's the most complete theory of consciousness and also the most easily falsifiable theory of consciousness. And if you look at the uh, schematic under the title, it's a uh, hierarchy, kind of like the time crystal that uh, Honorbaum was talking about. And on the far left, the pyramidal neuron, and many uh, schemes of hierarchical arrangements of the brain start with neurons as fundamental units and then go up, go to the left, to assemblies, networks, regions, the whole brain, etc. But the point is that we need to go downward in size and faster in frequency to the right, into networks of microtubules, microtubules, uh, tubulin dipoles, tubulin molecule itself, resonance dipoles, and then uh, ultimately all the way to the Planck scale according to Roger's objective reduction. So as, as I said, uh, most theories in neuroscience see the brain as a neuronal synaptic computer with neurons and their axonal firings as fundamental bits. And we send the Hodgkin-Huxley integrate and fire neuron as a, a threshold logic device uh, in, in a computer. And uh, Hodgkin Huxley from the 50s, uh, with all the signaling due to uh, ion uh, uh, propagation across the membrane, so surface uh, signaling, uh, with a cell body and dendrites at the bottom and the left, and an axon which uh, uh, conveys the, the signal to the next neuron. So integrate in the cell body and dendrites, fire in the axon, integrate, fire, integrate, fire, integrate, fire. And this is what Hodgkin Huxley is predicted to look at schematically. And upper left, you see the, the gray area is the integration and the red are the axonal firings. And you can see that the firings have a very narrow threshold. If you look uh, lower left, a very uh, uh, narrow firing threshold and narrow time threshold. So you have a, a skinny spike and it's, uh, it's sloped because on the right, uh, the idea is that ion channels open sequentially down the axon. And this is from Nondorf and et al in 2006. However, when, and, and this approach would be deterministic, algorithmic, uh, no consciousness or free will. These would just be simple threshold logic devices. However, when they measured from neuron, pyramidal neurons of awake cats, uh, experimentally, they found significant deviation from Hodgkin-Huxley with a very wide threshold, uh, voltage threshold, and a very wide temporal variability, and a vertical uh, slope, meaning that the ion channels were opening uh, simultaneously rather than sequentially. So there's some hidden variable influencing uh, firing in neurons of awake animals. And this is precisely where consciousness could come in and regulate behavior. It'd be a very strategic uh, place and time to do that. 
And so Bing, which I've used to indicate consciousness uh, in my talks, would be in this temporal variability, whatever is causing it. And where might that be? Uh, could it be a deeper level? And that's the claim, that if we go inside of a neuron, shown here, on the left we see the dendrite, uh, two dendrites actually, and on the right we see an axon, and we see a synapse on the left. And uh, m almost everybody pays attention to the synapses and what's happening at the membrane. But we think the real action, the consciousness, the bing, is in the cytoskeleton and the microtubules, particularly those in dendrites, for reasons that I'll come to later. What do microtubules do? They do a lot of things. And among them is transport of material uh, that are made in a cell body uh, to a distant synapse. So uh, below you see uh, a neuron in blue with the axon going downward to the left. And in the middle is a dendrite. And we've blown that up to see a single microtubule that is acting as kind of a, a track for motor proteins, the kinesin and dynein, these funny looking molecules that literally run or dance or prance actually, if you look at them, along the microtubule. And the tau protein, tau is a, a famous uh, microtubule associated protein. And according to this paper from uh, 2008, placement of the tau signals the kinesin where to get off and to deliver its cargo to a particular synapse. So moving from left to right, the, the uh, kinesins or dynings must jump from microtubule to microtubule. And when they get to a branch point, go left or right to find the synapse that needs to be upreg upregulated. And this seems to be encoded by location of the tau on the microtubule. And uh, uh, this is a form of memory, encoding memory by exact placement of tau proteins on the microtubule lattice. And if the microtubules fall apart, and if the tau falls off of the microtubule, you get Alzheimer's disease. You lose cognition and ultimately consciousness. And this also occurs with too many anesthetics and what we call postoperative cognitive dysfunction, POCD. So uh, it's, uh, if the microtubules fall apart, you lose memory and you lose cognition and ultimately consciousness. So this raised the point of whether microtubules might actually be information processing processors. And I got this idea actually in the 70s when I was in medical school stu uh, studying mitosis and uh, learned about computers and cellular automata and microtubules and published a bunch of papers in the 80s about computing in microtubules based on uh, cellular automata. And then when I met Roger, uh, we uh, developed a, a number of uh, articles about microtubules as quantum computers, which I'll be uh, coming to shortly. So uh, what about memory? Um, we still don't know where memory is. Most people would say it's in the uh, synaptic synapses, the strength of the synapses, but synaptic proteins last hours to days and memories can last a lifetime. LTP, long-term potentiation, is a model for memory in, in, a, in a dish. And uh, when uh, uh, the synapse is activated and calcium comes in, one of the things that happens is that this enzyme, CAMK2, is activated and by calcium, and it undergoes a, a, a transition and then binds onto microtubules and can, can phosphorylate, and then somehow uh, memory occurs. So how does that happen? Well, here's how we think it happens, and we in this case is uh, Travis Craddock, Jack Tusinski, and our collaborators. Uh, who, we did this paper in 2012. On the left, you see the CAMK2, which is a, a beautiful snowflake-shaped hexagonal molecule, and on the, below you see the, the, the side view. And when calcium comes in, the synaptic activation occurs, the CAMK2 activates and extends these kinase domains above and below into this, what kind of looks like a, a nano robot or a nano poodle, some people say. With, uh, on the far right, you can see the phosphorylation sites, which, which can impart information, uh, which could be a memory. So what's getting phosphorylated in the cell to encode memory? Well, it's a hexagonal molecule. Microtubules have hexagonal lattices. And we did the measurement, and, and sure enough, uh, the, the CAMK2 fits perfectly onto the A lattice shown on the left under B above, or the uh, B lattice shown under C. Sorry about that. Uh, and down below, you can see how uh, uh, the uh, CAMK2 can bind to six tubulins uh, at a time in a lattice and therefore impart up to six bits of information. So two to the sixth uh, uh, possible uh, information states per CAMK2, and thousands are released uh, with each synaptic event. So uh, here's what we think in terms of memory, that the CAMK2 on the left lands on the microtubule, 
with, with its six kinase domains, and uh, zero or up to six of them can phosphorylate, leaving, in this case, six, a hexagonal uh, memory trace on the microtubule. And this may be related to higher level hex hexagonal codes and neurons, such as what we're gonna hear from uh, Edvard Moser, the Nobel laureate uh, in the next session uh, at, at a higher level in entorhinal cortex uh, grid cells. And uh, the bottom line is that microtubules and dendrites and soma are ideal sites for memory encoding in the brain. They're stable and can store information for a long, long time. So if we step back and look at uh, what microtubules might have to do with information processing, the top is uh, the uh, conventional neuronal synaptic computation AI singularity approach, which gives us about 10 to the 16th operations per second per brain. Ray uh, Kurzweil used to say, well, when we, get to, when we get to 10 to the 6 operations per second, we'll have brain equivalents and consciousness. Well, that's long since happened and, and machines aren't conscious yet. However, on the bottom, you see if you include the microtubules, and there's about uh, 10 to the 8th or 10 to the 9th tubulins per neuron, that you get a total of the same 10 to the 16th operations per second per every neuron, and a total of 10 to the 27th operations per second per brain. So I was going around being a pest at AI and neural net meetings saying, uh, you guys have a, your goalpost is way downstream. And they didn't like that. They, they kind of said, go away, kid, you bother me. They didn't want to deal with it. But then one day somebody had a very good point. He said to me, well, it's just more computation. Where's the consciousness? Where's the bing as it were? Is something else required and could it be quantum physics? And fortunately he referred me to Roger's book the Emperor's New Mind, which I read in the early 1990s, and uh, really uh, was, was very impressed and kind of blown away by it, and the rest, so to speak, is history. And um, in it, 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 it covered so, so much different area, but, but one point I want to dwell on is quantum superposition. A particle can exist as a wave of multiple possibilities, or as a particle, this is a, a cesium atom, so you can see it as a wave of multiple locations of uh, possibilities or as a particle if you see it. Uh, but uh, superpositions are not observed. The act of measurement or comp conscious observation seems to cause collapse of the wave function. But why is this? This is the measurement problem in quantum mechanics. And this is, of course, uh, exemplified by Schrodinger's cat, the mythical story of, of the amplification of a quantum system uh, to the fate of a cat that according to Schrodinger, according to the interpretation that consciousness causes collapse would be both dead and alive until someone opened the box and took a look at it. So the, the point was that uh, suggesting that conscious observation causes collapse. This was put forth by uh, von Neumann, uh, Wigner, uh, more recently Stapp, Chalmers, and McQueen. Consciousness causes collapse. Uh, but there's a, uh, we'll come back to that, but there's another more fundamental question. How can a particle be in multiple locations simultaneously? How is that even possible? And Roger uh, accounted for the superposition through Einstein's general relativity, and, and in doing so, put forth the most specific scientific proposal for consciousness ever put forth. Uh, he began by relating uh, superposition, uh, uh, superposition and quantum physics to uh, general relativity, another neat feat since they don't really uh, uh, communicate that well. But relatively had shown matter was related to curvature in fundamental space-time geometry, at least at large scales. Uh, Roger brought the uh, question to small scales. What about matter and space-time curvatures at very uh, tiny scales and level of uh, individual atoms or subatomic particles? And he saw that as a curvature, a location of a particle in one place, as a particular curvature in space-time, and if it moved, shown below, a different curvature. So you have alternate space-time curvatures uh, uh, representing the, uh, the oscillation of a particle. And he further went on that superposition of those particles would be um, opposing curvatures, separations in fundamental space-time geometry that we see on the right. So we see two curvatures and two particles separated, a quantum superposition as separated space-time curvature. Now you could imagine if these separations were to continue that uh, each possibility would branch off and form its own universe. This would give you the multiple worlds hypothesis that uh, Hartmut and, and Peter uh, referred to uh, earlier. But you don't necessarily need multiple worlds. 
Uh, Roger pointed out that these uh, super, superposition separations would be unstable and would self-collapse, undergo objective reduction, OR, due to an objective threshold at a particular time, T equals H bar over E sub G. T is the time at which the collapse or the objective reduction would occur, and E sub G is the gravitational energy, the amount of energy required to pull a particle from itself uh, to, uh, to be quite literally next to each other. And the kicker was that when this occurred, there would be a moment of conscious experience shown here as Bing down at, at the Planck scale. So the idea was that rather than consciousness causing collapse, which von Neumann, Wigner, and others had been saying for a century or more, uh, that collapse, objective reduction, causes consciousness or is equivalent to consciousness. So the spontaneous self-collapse due to quantum gravity due to uh, general relativity would produce a moment of consciousness. The only specific scientific proposal yet proposed for generation of, of qualia and consciousness. So at the top, we see the uh, Copenhagen interpretation of von Neumann Wigner, where Bing in a conscious observer causes one of the space-time curvatures to cease to exist, uh, but you need a conscious observer, and then you would have to explain why he or she is conscious and how that causes the uh, reduction. Or use Roger's approach where the superposition is unstable and after time t uh, equals h bar over e sub g would self collapse and you get a moment of bing at that time and the uh, space time curvature ceases. And it, what Roger's going to talk about in his talk is that the space time curvature actually uh, goes back to have never existed, it goes back to the bifurcation uh, that, that he'll be talking about. In the random environment, decoherence, such OR events would be isolated and lack meaning and content. They would be proto-conscious and they would be occurring randomly and ubiquitously in the environment everywhere, uh, even now in, in all kinds of inanimate and animate objects uh, everywhere. Um, but they're, they're isolated, random, lack meaning and would be merely proto-conscious and not amount to much. So it's a bit like panpsychism, except it's the process of selecting a particular state of matter that is what's causing consciousness rather than the property of the state of matter itself. I think that's a subtle but very important uh, distinction uh, from other from panpsychist uh, approaches. Um, they are also similar, the proto-conscious events would be similar to what Whitehead called simple occasions of experience. And I liken them to notes tones and sound of an orchestra warming up, a cacophony, these random proto-conscious events everywhere. They're kind of like noise. Uh, and what we need uh, in the brain or in biology is for them to be organized or orchestrated into living systems, something more like music than noise. Could microtubules do it? Well, that's the idea and that's, uh, that's what we've been working on uh, since the mid 1990s. But microtubules are living systems. So the question is, how do we get quantum computing uh, terminated by objective reduction uh, out of uh, living systems? Um, so let's talk a little bit about organic uh, chemistry. In the 19th century, chemists knew the structure of hydrocarbon chains of uh, alkanes and alkenes of these formulas, CnH2n plus two and CnH2n, but did not understand C6H6. And uh, Kekulé, uh, uh, a German chemist, uh, had a dream one night of a snake swallowing its tail, the hydrocarbons being uh, uh, the snakes. And uh, this is also something called the Ouroboros. And he woke up in the morning and said, aha, C6H6, benzene must be a ring. And sure enough, he was right. Six carbon ring with three extra electrons shown in the, uh, in the description uh, below. Um, what happens to these three extra electrons is that they form a cloud above and below the hexagonal carbon. And this electron uh, cloud has delocalized electrons and supports electric and magnetic dipole oscillations, excitons, charge transfer, phonons, fluorescence uh, conducive to quantum effects. Uh, these, pi, these pi resonance groups, a single benzene, for example, uh, or, or two of them will attract each other by van der Waals forces and come to the van der Waals radius and then oscillate in terahertz, dipole oscillations at 10 to the 12th, and can also form quantum superpositions of both dipole orientations. 
if you attach a, uh, a, a water-soluble polar tail, you get an amphipathic molecule, uh, very much like some amino acids and dopamine. The nonpolar rings attract, uh, oil and water don't mix, so these oily uh, uh, groups come together and form a uh, nonpolar region with the polar tail sticking out. And this was called the micelle by operin, and proteins fold in this way. The aromatic amino acids coalesce and go into the middle, and the polar tail stick out into the exterior. So here's another, here's a particular protein, tubulin, uh, shown on the left, and it has 86 of these pi resonance rings, uh, which are shown at tryptophan, phenylalanine, tyrosine uh, above. This was done by Travis Craddock's group in, in 2012. And the red spheres are anesthetic uh, molecules uh, where they bind. And you can see there's, there's quite a bunch of uh, uh, regions of these nonpolar uh, pi resonance groups which are conducive to quantum effects. Uh, and this is exactly where anesthetics bind, and we think to prevent, to dampen the quantum oscillations that give rise to consciousness. Uh, in addition to proteins, lipid bilayers and nucleic acids have pi resonance nonpolar interiors where quantum effects can occur at warm temperatures. So we, uh, uh, Travis Craddock, Jack Jasinski, and I have published a paper claiming a quantum underground pervades living systems on these nonpolar regions. And this is the regions, these are the regions where anesthetic gases bind specifically to, to block consciousness. So uh, similar structures, these pi resonance groups are found in chromophores, which are in uh, photosynthesis uh, proteins, the FMO protein in particular, to make energy and food. And uh, we've known for the last uh, 15 years or so that uh, this utilizes quantum coherence, quantum coherence superposition. The light is converted to excitons and transferred through the FMO protein uh, in superposition going through seven uh, of these chromophores simultaneously uh, among the nonpolar pi resonance clouds, allowing extreme uh, efficiency in converting a food, and this may be why uh, we, life has flourished uh, on Earth because of the efficiency of food production by plants. And in um, uh, Engel and in a number of other people's around t uh, people around 2006 showed that this was indeed a quantum superposition effect using uh, something called 2D electron spectroscopy of this protein, generating wave-like motion of excitation energy. Uh, in our, what are called quantum beats, indicating quantum superposition at biological temperatures. Now, this was very short-lived, but this is the kind of experiment we want to do in microtubules to see if we get these quantum, quantum coherence beats long enough uh, to, to account for consciousness. And you can see sure. the beats on the sure. left. Five-minute warning. This is the uh, uh, signature of quantum coherence. So uh, psychedelics also have quantum, uh, also have these pi resonance groups, and anesthetic gases have the, uh, the pi resonance groups as well, and they do the opposite. Uh, at low concentrations, they, call, uh, they cause giddiness and euphoria, but at high concentrations, they cause reversible loss of consciousness, as we see here. I'm going to skip through the anesthetic story. I've given it before, and, uh, and suggest that anesthetic gases dampen quantum dipole oscillations, and we know that anesthetics act in proteins. We don't know exactly which protein. There's some evidence that they act in uh, tubulin and microtubules. And we did a modeling study uh, showing that there is at KT, the 86 pi resonance groups give a, uh, a collective dipole oscillate, a common mode peak at 613 terahertz. And this disappears with anesthetic gases uh, proportional to their potency shown here which I'm just going to skip through. There were also uh, two other outlier proteins that uh, bind but don't cause uh, loss of consciousness. And this is because we showed uh, that they, ha they, are, uh, they have high polarizability and go along for the ride when, with these oscillations. So anesthetic acid abolished the terahertz peak as an interneuronal correlate of consciousness. But how does this lead to consciousness uh, in, in Orca War? Well, um, one way we think is through this uh, interference uh, effect where the, uh, 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 you percolate from the very small and interfere to get slower and slower, larger scale effects uh, seen at the level of neurons down to EEG frequencies. Okay, we faced a number of problems in putting forth the idea that microtubules are quantum computing. Computers, is the brain too warm, wet, and noisy? 
Uh, we counter that by saying photosynthesis proteins utilize superposition pi resonance. The Meyer Overton quantum underground provides a decoherence free sub subspace. And Onderbon and his colleagues showed quantum resonance in microtubules in terahertz, gigahertz, megahertz, and 10 kilohertz. And here's his data that he's published uh, at three different scales showing uh, these uh, triplets of triplets in terahertz, gigahertz, and megahertz, uh, all the way up to, uh, to hertz. Now, the next question, what was the qubit? Uh, we propose or uh, uh, microcubules act as quantum computers, which terminate by OR, introducing non-computability, conscious experience, and selecting microtubule states to exert causal action. We needed to define the or OR qubit. Uh, initially, each tubulin was considered a qubit, but the geometric pathway qubits are far more feasible. So we start with the amino acids inside the tubulin and come up with a, uh, a dipole pathway through a tubulin. And these uh, connect to uh, neighboring tubulins in the Fibonacci uh, geometry of the A lattice to give helical pathways that go the whole length of the microtubule in opposite direction. So that's the OR qubit, quite stable and, and possibly uh, error correcting in and of itself. How about quantifying OR? To account for conscious moments, we first determine the maximum E sub G. Uh, I'll skip over this and say the brain has about 10 to the 20 tubulins. At 10 megahertz, you would need five times 10 to the 15th uh, tubulins, about 10 to the minus fourth of capacity. And uh, these would interfere to give slower frequencies suited to cognitive processing than EEG. And this would be happening most likely in the cortical layer five pyramidal neurons as Horacio's, uh, uh, the EEG, Horacio Cantiello's talk later on today. Now we can quantify this by plotting simply the number of tubulins on the x-axis and the uh, frequency of the uh, or orca wire events, which would also relate to the intensity of experience. And we, we get this, uh, we can see the human maximum, if all the tubulins in our brain, we would, we would get uh, frequencies of about 10 to the 13th. And as you go down to say 10 to the 10th, which is probably where, and then smaller organisms, including cerebral organoids that Ellis and Mawatri will talk about, uh, paramecium and even plants, as you go to the left and downward, uh, these uh, organisms could be conscious, but at a very slow rate and very low intensity. A plant cell might have one or two conscious moments per second, where we have uh, 10 million, for example. Orco wire and free will. Collapse of the wave function exerts causal action, selects particular states, which regulate axonal firings. A problem for, for, with free will, as we heard yesterday, is that activity correlating with conscious perception occurs after we respond seemingly consciously. Orcoar can accommodate retroactivity that Roger will talk about, which can have backward effect in time, as shown in Libet's uh, experiment to enable real-time conscious control. And I wrote, up, wrote about that in that particular paper. Um, and I showed you that this is how the uh, backward time effects could, could affect uh, uh, our actions in real time so that we can have real-time conscious control of our actions. Uh, a little bit about evolution. Most view, consciousness emerge, most view consciousness as emerging from as a property of information processing. But if OR or any form of panpsychism uh, is correct, consciousness or protoconsciousness would be intrinsic to the world and present at the origin of life. So when did consciousness arise? Um, uh, or to put it another way, which came first, uh, consciousness or life? And uh, in OR and panpsychism, consciousness preceded life, or proto-consciousness at least, and life may have emerged from consciousness. And uh, so in the primordial soup uh, proposed in the 1920s by Opera and Haldane, uh, there and reproduced by, in the 50s by Miller and Urey, there were these amphipathic molecules which look a lot like dopamine and they have oil-like rings on one end and polar on the other. And back in the primordial soup, they could have formed my cells, which would reach a particular threshold for orc OR, or for OR rather, and have a conscious moment or a proto-conscious moment. Um, and these feelings, primitive feelings would be random, but some would be positive and feel good. Uh, and I'm gonna use a little emoji there to say uh, occasionally some would feel good. And this reminds me of Hartman and, and Peter's talk, except it's a biological effect. Now there are two separate, two types of stable arrangements of pi resonance groups, T-shaped and parallel displaced. And it could be that one is, one is happy and one is sad, just as a simplistic approach. And uh, if we have 86 of them in tubulin, you could have quite a, 
a, a plethora of different uh, qualia combinations. So with pleasure as a feedback thickness function orienting pi resonance group, life could have evolved to orchestrate and optimize OR mediated pleasure, the quantum pleasure principle, I call this, with uh, apologies to Freud. So um, Darwin is important, but behavior is driven by reward, pleasure, avoiding pain. There are no genes in the primordial soup. Evolutionary theory ignores consciousness. The question is, did feelings drive evolution, even to this day? Not necessarily hedonistic, but altruistic and different forms of, of pleasure. Psychedelics, uh, uh, anesthetics dampen, and uh, psychedelics we predict, or I predict rather, would cause faster vibrations and uh, take uh, consciousness deeper into non-locality, increased bandwidth, interconnected connectivity, and experiential intensity. The deeper you go, the higher you fly, is a line from a Beatles song. The most likely sites for ORC OR are cortical layer 5 pyramidal cells. This is a rendition to show that the uh, microtubules are interrupted and of mixed polarity, which gives a lot, rise to recursive processing. The centriole centrosome is probably very important. We haven't appreciated that. And the AIS, the axon initiation segment, where the axon spike begins is actually determined by the, the geometry of the microtubules. So that's another thing to explore. Near death, and I'm speaking for myself, not necessarily, not Roger necessarily, but it is conceivable that orc OR consciousness could become completely delocalized and exist in space time, independent of the brain temporarily or indefinitely. I'm not claiming this, I don't know that it's true, but you can't rule it out until we understand what consciousness is. Finally, OR is being tested in terms of the measurement problem. ORC will be tested through the uh, uh, Templeton program, Accelerating Research and Consciousness, with Jack Jusinski, Arat Kara, Greg Scholes, uh, and Aristide Dogaris, Dogariu, using this type of experiment, but for microtubules. And if we get these interference beats, we'll then try to anesthetize them and see if they go away, and then maybe give them psychedelics and see if they increase in frequency. So if superposition interference beats are not detected in tubular microtubules, or if detected are not dampened, by anesthetics, then ORCOR will be falsified. So we're very easy to be falsified, and yet, as I claim, we uh, have the greatest explanatory power. Conclusion, ORCOR is a complete theory accounting for the hard problem, causality, anesthetic action, possibly afterlife memory, evolution, altered states. Pyramidal neurons are the best site for consciousness, and ORCOR can be easily falsified by failing to find these quantum vibrations dampened by anesthetics and promoted by psychedelics. Sorry for rushing. Thanks a lot. Appreciate it. Stuart, thank you so much. So You're we, welcome. It's always a pleasure. So we have a, a lot of questions from the audience here. I've accumulated my own list, but I think let's hold those off for the general Q&A session in about half an hour. And because I'm just dying to hear what Roger has to say. And if, if we could move over to, to Roger Penrose, because this is a talk I've been waiting for uh, for a while, and I'd like to hear, uh, like to get straight to that. Roger, are you there? I'm here, but I don't know whether the systems works because I, ha I was changing it all the way <laughs> uh, before we got to this point. So I, let's, I need, may need some adjustment about the, the screen position. Yeah. Just a tiny bit of adjustment so we can see your beautiful face. Uh, well, I'm not sure about the beautiful part, but <laughs> I don't know. I, all I would do is move my face over here, so it's in front of the screen. Does that help? I mean, can you? How, what can you see now? Do you That's need? Perfect. Perfect. Keep it just like that. Okay, fine. No, I'll I'll, I'll do that right. <clears throat> <clears throat> okay. Shall I start? Very good. Please do. Yes. Well, uh, the title of my talk, as you, I hope, can see, is that, well, ORCO R, and it's really about new developments on OR. OR. So I should explain that move, things have happened during the lockdown period, because normally during uh, most of my time, I would be gadding about the world ruining my uh, carbon footprint and so on or at least enhancing it, I suppose, which is the wrong way around. And uh, unable to do this, I was able to think about things which I'd been sort of leaving aside for a long time. And uh, I thought it was worth thinking about 
more about the aura part, that is to say physics. And uh, I want to talk about some of the things that I've come upon since the beginning of lockdown, which are basically new. Um, not all to do with the gravitational uh, reduction of the state. I should explain what OR is, and I hope you can read the bottom of this picture. Is that, can that be read? What I want to say is yes, that OR that. stands for the objective reduction of the quantum state. And of course, the acronym OR says one or the other, rather than a superposition of the two because quantum mechanics just leads, leads to these more and more messed up superpositions and you don't resolve out one thing or another. People often say that quantum mechanics is the most wonderful theory we've ever, ever had in physics. The trouble with it is that it's self-inconsistent theory and I don't think the most wonderful theory ought to be in, inconsistent with itself. It's self-inconsistent because, well, let's go to the, uh, well, before going to that, yeah, no, let's say about it. A little bit more about or. See, it's self inconsistent because it consists of two features. The most uh, detailed one, if you like, is the Schrodinger equation. This is an equation which tells you how the state of the universe evolves. And the, that Schrodinger equation does not tell you what happens in the world. And now let me say a bit more about that. But before coming to that, I thought I would mention a paper which came out just last week. It came out on Monday in uh, uh, Nature Physics and it's, I don't know, I'll put it up here. I don't know whether the, uh, this is, I hope that's more or less in the middle of the screen there. Um, the paper is about an experiment which has been just done recently about putting a crystal, I forgot whether it's Germanian or something, and they try to see whether you get radiation from it. Now, I should explain that there are many theories of OR. They don't necessarily call it OR. The idea is that, well, some people don't worry about the reduction of the state at all. They just go on and do their quantum. I'm, well, I'm talking about people who work in quantum theory. They may uh, not worry about it. They just use the rules and forget about the fact they're self inconsistent. The Schrodinger equation does not have a collapse in it. The collapse is something which has to be introduced outside. There are various proposals for sort of classical ones that somehow when the environment gets mixed up with the state, then you might as well say the collapse has happened. I should say these arguments are not correct. They're very, very uh, prominent and people somehow believe, okay, when you don't preserve your quantum state very precisely and the environment gets mixed up with it, then somehow uh, one thing happens or the other. Well, that's not true. It's just that the environment gets entangled with the one thing and with the other, and it's just a, such a mess that uh, there is a procedure which people adopt often, which is a bit of magic. I mean, you wave your hands around. It's not a consistent procedure, and it doesn't really explain why one thing happens or the other. There are other models like many worlds, as we had earlier mentioned today, uh, which means that all these things do happen all at once. So that doesn't really explain why we don't experience more than one thing. So it means in a sense that one's consciousness maybe follows one of these, but then why does, why does somebody else's consciousness follow the same thing? Or do I lose all my friends because they've all gone different, down different tracks? I've never, I should say, it's probably a stage in life in physics which you go through. There was a time when I went through this stage. I don't remember how many weeks I, it lasted, but I certainly did contemplate the idea of a many worlds picture before coming to the conclusion that really we need something much more drastic than that. It doesn't explain anything. Um, okay. Now, among those people who think th something should be done about it, there are very, well, broad categories of theory. Um, and most of these involve um, either heating. See, if you have an object, let me just explain it. I, this is a, an article I, I didn't want really to go into and I hope you don't see it very clearly because, well, I'm, you won't be able to see the small print. But it's basically disproving what they call the, the Deoshi Penrose model. And uh, they come to a conclusion that the Deoshi Penrose model, or, well, you see, here's the second page of this article. And at the top, there's a sort of cartoon of what happens. You have a, an atom in one place superposed with an atom in another place and the sum of those is what happens. They're both at once. 
And the idea is that if you have any theory which collapses the state, it becomes one or the other, then you sort of jump from this state to that. And this jump is a sort of, it causes heat because you have some motion. It, and if you have a jump in your system, then it, it's likely that you would expect, well, things get jiggled around and so it pr provides heat. Or in this case, what they're studying is it produces radiation. And so they went, considered putting these crystals down a mine to see whether they actually radiate down a mine because there's all sorts of other radiation going on and they want to shield all that out just to make sure that they see this particular radiation. They don't see anything. And so they conclude this is a disproof of this model. It probably is a disproof of this model, but it's not my model, even though it has my name attached to it. I should explain why it has my name attached to it, because the criterion that this Hungarian physicist Dioshi put forward several years before I did, which is a proposal for the rate at which the reduction takes place. And it has to do with if you have a superposition between two states, here we have a, something in one place and something in the other, and you look at the difference between this mass distribution and that one, and you look at the gravitational self-energy of that, and the reciprocal of that is the rate of decay. And that formula is the same as one I used. I came about it from quite a different direction, but that is the same formula. So that's why they link our names. But in my model, and I'm going to try and explain it because it's, it's, it's a bit outrageous what I want to say, but then quantum mechanics is outrageous and the reduction of the quantum state is pretty outrageous. So you need something, I think, fairly outrageous to explain what's going on. And it's more outrageous than I expected at first. But the, a lot of the things I want to say are not specific to my model. They apply to other models like this. Well, this one, yeah, I'll say that. It does apply to it in a sense. Let me, before going to that, say just something about quantum mechanics as it's normally used. And here we have Schrodinger's equation written at the top. The main point about it, which I want to make, is it's a linear equation. You just have a derivative and you've got psi's on both sides. Psi is the quantum state. And it's because, uh, well, you have a, the Hamiltonian, which is a linear operator. Everything is linear. What does linear mean? Well, you see, if you have one solution of the equation, and you call it psi, usually this letter is used for the wave function. If you have one solution, and if you have another solution, we call phi, then any linear combination, alpha psi plus beta phi, is also a solution. That's the whole point of linearity. Alpha is a constant, beta is a constant. These are complex numbers, and they are related to when you make a measurement. If you make a measurement to ask the question, is it A or is it B, or is it alpha or is it, is it psi or is it phi, you should say, then the squared modulus of these numbers give you the relative probability. So that's the Born rule. Now, the problem with linearity, as Schrodinger was very clear to point out, people often point to the Schrodinger's cat and say, well, if you had a really elaborate experiment, you could put a, a cat in a state that was alive and dead at the same time, and isn't that wonderful? Schrodinger was really pointing out the absurdity of, of his own equation. To have a state where you have a, a cat which is alive and dead at the same time, he regarded as an absurdity, as I do. Nevertheless, uh, you, it's it's a, a rational conclusion from this linearity. Here I have a, a laser, and here we have a beam splitter, that's a half silver mirror, if you like. It, it, it emits a single photon. This single photon goes along, it splits into two, so the photon's location is partly going along here and partly going here. The, the state of the photon is a superposition of these two different routes. This route goes and it fires a gun. I should say that there's a cat at the other side of the room here. If it goes this way, the cat is unharmed. If it goes this way, it fires a gun, kills the poor cat, and the state, if the photon is in the state of a linear superposition of these two, which it is, as the photon goes along, its state becomes a linear superposition of here and here. So the reality of the world, if you like, is this together with that on top of each other. This one fires a gun, and therefore, if, you, if the linearity continues right up to this level, then you must have a cat in a state which is alive and dead at the same time. So that is a completely correct conclusion of the formalism. 
and Schrodinger was basically pointing out that his, the formulas, he's really pointing out a flaw, if you like, in his own theory. He's saying, roughly speaking, my theory can't be right because it predicts such absurdities. People often don't, don't read it that way. Let me, um, I could move things sideways. I'm not sure whether if I put both together that can be seen. Um, let me do that if you like. I don't know if you, can you see both of them to one, at once or? Yes, we can. Okay. Now I'm going to raise this question. Is, is the state vector or is the, is the wave function, is it real? Now you see, people often say, well, it's not really real. It's something which is, it tells you probabilities. It's really telling you something about the probability of one thing happening or of another thing happening. It's not really probabilities because these numbers, alpha and beta, are not probabilities. They're amplitudes. They're more subtle quantities. You have to take the squared modulus, which is a number, to get the probabilities, the ratios of these squared modulus. But there's more information in it. These, these amplitudes are very subtle quantities and they're not probabilities. They're certainly not probabilities. There's something from which you can get your probabilities if you have a measurement which uh, t distinguishes one from the other, the, the psi state from the phi state. Now, is it real? Now, my eyesight is not good enough to read this down here, but this is a quote from a famous paper by Einstein and co colleagues of what he calls an element of reality. <clears throat> what he says more or less is that something has an element of reality if you can predict with certainty the result of an experiment which does not disturb the system. So if you have an experiment which you perform on that system and it doesn't disturb the system and it provides the answer yes that you expect with certainty then there is an element of, to, of reality to be attached to that thing and i think it's a very good criterion it has very strange consequences one of the consequences however is that the wave function is real there's a little confusion of terminology here because real is not in the mathematical sense <laughs> the state is a complex thing not not real in the real number sense but real in the sense of reality well in a sense, yes, because there's a theory, always a theoretical experiment you could perform, whether you can actually perform it, there's a theoretical experiment, which could tell you that the state, it gives you answer, yes, if it is in this state, with certainty. And that's the only state which will give the answer with certainty, yes. <clears throat> I won't go into that because my arguments don't really depend upon it, but I say it does have a kind of reality. So I'm going to say that the quantum state is real. Now, I'm going to say something more about this. Namely, this is what one of the things that came about from my worrying about, well, in the lockdown, trying to worry about the reduction of the state. There really are two kinds of reality. And this didn't occur to me for quite a long time. The reality here is what we're going to call quantum reality. And I'm calling this Einstein's dictum. If you can well, let me say the two kinds of reality. In classical reality, you can ask the state of the system, what is your state? And it can say, my state is X. You can go and explore it and measure it and all sorts of things. And yes, it, you can find out what it is. You can find out what its state is. You don't tell it, you don't put to it what its state might be. You say, what is your state? And it says, my state is X. That's classical reality. Many experiments are of that nature. Quantum reality is the Einstein dictum thing. You can't ask what its state is, but what you can do is you can make a little calculation. You think, oh, I think the state by now ought to be X. And then you say, can you confirm whether your state is X? And it says, yes, with certainty. You can repeat the same experiment many, many times. Every time it will come up with the answer, yes. So Einstein says, this is a real thing. But the point I'm trying to make, it's a different kind of reality. And I think this is an important point. So I want now to say a little bit about the classical reality here. Let me consider a situation. That, let me not take that, away, take that away for the moment. I'm going to consider many of my diagrams will be space-time diagrams. This is a space-time diagram. Time is going up the picture. Now I'm considering a lump of an object, a lump here, and you're hitting it with a beam split photon. So it's not the cat 
which could be uh, dead or alive. Um, I can find that again. But what it does is if the photon goes one way, it gives the object a little push. If it goes, the, is that the cat? No, I'm looking at the one. I'm afraid I have to apologize. My eyesight is very bad and I can't necessarily see these things. Here we go. Here we have a laser and instead it goes beam split. Instead of firing a gun, it pushes a lump. So if it goes this way, it pushes the lump. If it goes that way, it doesn't. So we have a lump in the superposition of two locations. I'll say a bit more about this later. But here we have a, a history. As time progresses, think is it going up here? The thing is put into a superposition of these two different locations. Now, after a while, it reaches this criterion to say, well, it's likely that it's going to reduce to one or the other. And let's say it does. The dotted line means it's the superposition of these two different histories as time progresses. And then it becomes this one, not that one. So this one disappears. So that is the sort of history of this evolution. Now, the problem I'm raising here is that I'm not a relativistic picture. That is to say, you're trying to consider that simultaneously the lump becomes one over here and not over here. However, let me consider an observer moving at great speed to the left in the picture. And the line here represents simultaneous events. And as that time progresses, that line is tilted with regard to the other line. And so if this one becomes the lump location here, and this one disappears, when you get to this point, the lump is here, there, and partly there, there. And this is a terrible thing, because if it was partly there, it means that if you perform a measurement, there's a 50% chance you might find it here, in which case you'd find it in both places. So that's a nonsense. What about the other? You can consider now the green person's measurement is the other way around. Now the simultaneous lines are this way, and then here's where you reach the problem. This one is still may, maybe there, maybe not there. This one is gone. So there's a 50% ch chance that it might disappear from here and 50% chance it might disappear. That's absolute nonsense. That's clearly wrong. So it can't be, the picture cannot be correct that somehow it disappears from one location, not from the other. Now you might have a model in which it sort of fades out gradually. It doesn't help. There's even a reason why models where, where, the, where the superposition sort of fades out and it becomes more and more one and less and less the other. And there, I have a strong argument why that can't work. Um, I'm not going to go into that argument. Uh, I think I'll give a hint as to what it is. And if anybody wants to know, I can talk about it. But what I really want to say is that the, a picture in which it disappears in one place after being uh, in a superposition, then it's totally in the other place, doesn't make relativistic sense. In fact, the only sense seems to me you can make of this picture, which is consistent with relativity, is to trace everything right back to here. So if it disappears here, it's as though the reality was this all the time. Now that's a, an absurd idea, you might think. It's uh, what I call the retroactive perspective. And I have here another picture of that. Perhaps I'll move this over to here. And what I'm saying is that we think now of the space times. Here I've just had these paths in space time, if you like. But you see, each of these lumps deforms the space time. So as we go along, here we have at the bottom of the picture, I hope you can see that, a, a laser here, a beam splitter there, the photon goes through, partly here and partly is displaced out that way. So the photon is in the superposition of coming this way and that way. So when it hits the lump, if it hits the lump, it moves it, it displaces it backwards a little bit. But if it doesn't hit it, it doesn't displace it. So the lump is in the superposition of being, well, as, the, as time evolves, it moves a little bit. So here it is in a superposition here and here, superposition here and here. But what we have to bear in mind is that the space time now becomes a superposition, in a sense, of two slightly different space times. Now the criterion that Deoshi and I formulated, I can phrase it a different way. And that is that the time up to the collapse, which is here, this is where it becomes one or the other, the, 
the, the difference between these space time, so that's a four dimensional distance, is one unit in Planck units. Now Planck unit is the unit that you get when you try to combine gravity with quantum mechanics and you get this absolute unit. And it usually puzzles people because they say if you get to that small distance then space doesn't make sense or something. But this is something rather different. They say that your space time, it can still be a continuous picture, but when you get a superposition which in space-time terms becomes one unit, then one of them has to drop off. Now it's just an average time, it doesn't happen exactly then, you have to think of this like an unstable particle which has a half-life and this is basically the half-life after which it becomes one or the other. Incidentally, it's slightly, well, I, I, on the right hand side I have the quantum reality. Now the quantum reality preserves both superpositions so that persists as a superposition. But the classical reality says it's got to be one all the time. So when this thing ch makes its choice, so the choice is made here in a sense, it affects the classical space-time back here. Now this is what is a sort of outrageous thing to say. It looks as though you're in the future influencing something in the past. But in a certain sense, I think this is what happens. You have to be careful of all sorts of paradoxes, and I'm worried about this, of course, I worry about paradoxes, uh, but I think it's safe from paradox. It, uh, it's, it's a, I should say, I did actually talk about this, I think it was two years ago at a Tucson conference, when right at the end of the conference, I mentioned this sort of idea. I hadn't really thought it through very much, but I did talk about it before. That was the first time that I ever put this particular idea forward. But uh, I've sort of filled it out quite a bit. Uh, into, and I think we have to think of the quantum reality and the classical reality. There, there's a bit of an irony here, because if you use Einstein's dictum, it doesn't quite give you this, because it would say, does it say with certainty it's this superposition or not? Well, you see, there's a little chance that it might reduce the state. So it's almost certainty, if you're way down here, say, it's almost certain that you're in this superposition, but not quite because it might reduce. So it gives a little bit of fuzziness to the quantum uncertainty, which is fine, but I thought I would mention that point. Now, let me give you another picture. This one I did give before, but it's in color, so you might like to see a colored picture of the same thing. Let's move that over here and uh, put my colored picture in. Here we have the, oh dear, I've only dropped something, I think. Oh, I've got it, yes. Here we have in color the same thing which is going on here, but it was space time, you see, the lump becomes in. To a superposition of two locations, and then after a little while, that's too much of a strain on the system. One of them has to die, and the other one lives. And this is where the reduction happens. And now I have a, a cartoon of, um, I think it's this way up. Here we have where the OR takes place. So we have objective reduction. This is the moment of proto consciousness. I like to call it proto consciousness, con not consciousness, because, well, if everything is conscious, you can't even walk down the street without killing something. Uh, and I think uh, proto consciousness is a safer thing. It's the proto, it's the building block out of which conscious, actual consciousness takes place. And it has to be orchestrated in some way, which is a much more subtle problem, I'm sure, to give something which is, we could call genuine. Um, something that can really feel something in a genuine sense. But in a certain sense, it's the or choice, which maybe gives us so, scope for free will. I've never been quite sure what I thought about free will. Um, and certainly the view is that if you have a deterministic universe, like Newtonian picture, or when you introduce Maxwell's equations, it does, it's still deterministic. If you introduce um, Maxwell's demons even, it's still, still deterministic. If you introduce, uh, the quantum wave function, you introduce a Schrodinger equation, it's still deterministic. It's not deterministic or something when you have this reduction of the state, and maybe that's where one's consciousness actually does come in and makes a decision which goes back in time in some sense. Now, this relates to, in fact, this was the sort of thing which I was worrying about before in the Tucson conference then, was 
experiments due to Benjamin Limit in the um, in the late 19, 1900s. And uh, I'll give you a picture of one set of these experiments, which is like, I mean, there are two classes of these experiments. These which involve where you make a movement. So there's the <coughs> um, active effect of consciousness. I will my hand to move this way. And there's the passive aspect of consciousness when you actually sense something. And there are these experiments which seem to indicate that moving something or other, there's a precursor of that. And, and people worried about this. I was never quite sure about that uh, because I'm never quite clear whether when you actually decide something, the precursor may be gearing yourself up to, set, to decide something, or I don't know. But the other one is to do with the sensation. And this is also a Libet experiment. And I've got a cartoon of this here. Well, no, this is actually a, not a cartoon, it's a, a picture. I don't want to talk about all these things, but uh, I think, let me explain the situation is. There is a stimulus to the hand, and this is, I think, an electrode, which is, touches the hand at a certain point. And this is, this is at the same time as this patient is having an operation on the brain for some other reason. And the part of that brain, which is concerned with the feeling of that part of the hand being stimulated, is being stimulated with an electrode. And it's a very, very interesting phenomenon. I think I'll describe this one particular one here, which is where you first of all stimulate the skin, and then a little bit later, you start to stimulate the brain. Now, if you don't stimulate the brain, the patient thinks that the stimulation of the skin is pretty well similar, simultaneous. The, I mean, it, it takes place at a certain moment and the patient feels it only slightly after that. So it's more or less simultaneously. Whereas if you stimulate that part of the brain up to about half a second later, then the patient doesn't feel the stimulation of the hand. It, it feels the stimulation of the brain, but it can distinguish, the patient can distinguish the difference between those two things. It feels like the skin, but not quite the same. You can say, no, no, it's not what it actually stimulating the skin feels like. I can tell the difference, but it's the same part of the skin that's involved. And if that stimulation takes place after the stimulation of the skin, within, I think, half a second or something, then <clears throat> you don't feel it, the actual stimulation of the skin <clears throat> at all, which is very remarkable. Now, it seems to me, this may tie in with some of the ideas I don't think Stuart mentioned particularly, but he did mention the pyramidal cells. And this may well be, I think he may have said, where the consciousness takes place. Now, it takes a while before the, the touching of the skin makes its way up to this part of the brain. And then you've got to, if that's when you become conscious of it, you have to refer it backwards to when you think the stimulation actually took place. Now you see, if you can also create an action, like as in this picture here, which moves your hand or whatever it does, you feel, you feel it up here, but then you start to do something a little bit earlier. You see, I've often worried about this delay that people say, well, you don't feel something till half a second later. And this always seemed to me a little bit strange because if you play ping pong, I used to play ping pong quite a bit, and this is something you, I mean, half, you know, it's got to be much, much less than half a second to do something. You've got to make a decision to do with the ball. And is this entirely unconscious or, or actually are you doing something consciously? It always seemed to me that you're doing something consciously, maybe not be, maybe pretty well pre-prepared the kind of thing you might do, but the choice may come later. So it's, it struck me as these things are things which do need explanation. And uh, I don't think, um, that, that uh, we can disregard experiments of this nature. How much time do I have left? Well, we're technically a little bit over. Do you think you can bring things to a nice, tidy conclusion? Yeah. All right, I'll bring it to a tidy conclusion, which is, what about an experiment which could test the retroactive perspective? Here it is. This is, I had experiments in my notes which were like this, but I stretched it out. So it's a stretched experiment. I hope you can see this. Here we have a beam splitter and 
a laser here. No laser is there, hits the beam splitter, the photon goes either this way or that way. If it goes this way, it hits a lump, starts it moving. If it goes this way, it hits a mirror, and there's a mirror on the lump which reflects it back. And if they're coherent, it goes straight back here, and the detector, detector over here won't feel anything. Now you see, I have did it here so that the, the beams come back after the lump has started moving, but it hasn't moved far enough for the state reductions to take place. It moves and moves, and then finally, it does one or the other. Now, when it does one or the other, any other model, I think, of state reduction would say, well, it's too late. The photon's already got back here, it's reassembled itself, and there's no way this detector would be activated. But in the retroactive picture, it would go back to, this, this is where the moment of reduction takes place, and it would have to go back to there, and therefore you would have 50% chance of this detector actually receiving the photo. It might be a pretty difficult experiment to do. It's not too far beyond the kind of experiment that Dirk Baumister has been doing to uh, test. It's an experiment uh, in my notes. It's, it's one like this here at the bottom where you have um, cavities and so on. I, I won't go into that unless anybody asks me. Um, but it could be done. It's certainly not on the cards yet. Uh, I, I think it should be, experiments should be geared to seeing whether this is possible or not. Thank you very much. Thanks so much, Roger. Well done. So, if I did, yes. So, let me take a few minutes to, to think about this because I, I, I'd like the audience and just all of us to, to consider and really get our minds around how radical a picture you're proposing, and in the same uh, sentence, also a picture very much in the mainstream of physics. This is an idea we have in the least action principle, for example, that you have to consider the entire trajectory from beginning to end of a, of a particle. So in a sense, there's a teleological aspect to physics already. And I'm wondering if you could just comment almost philosophically or just reflectively on the significance of your retroactive interpretation. Well, it's radically different from all these models. I mean, go back to Newton and uh, Laplace and people who uh, who worried about, uh, you know, where's free will? Even if you don't know what makes you make your choice or whatever it is. Um, but, well, if it's all predetermined and somebody, I mean, I, I think it was Laplace who made this particular point very strongly that some somebody could, in principle, or a calculation could exist, which would calculate what everything is going to do once you know the initial state. Um, I've lived with not really not making up my mind about this for a long time. And uh, uh, the Schrodinger equation is completely deterministic. The only place that there could be a, a difference there is in the reduction of the state. Now, uh, as I think was mentioned earlier, uh, there is this point of view that Maybe it is the conscious being that reduces the state. Now, I find this very difficult to swallow, particularly because you could think of an experiment like following. There is a space probe going out to look at a very distant planet, several light years away. It's an Earth-like planet, and so it's got an Earth-like atmosphere on it. And this probe goes out there, and may take several years to go out there, and it sends a signal, which takes quite a long time to get back to an observer looking at the signal. Now, it's pro, it's having, it takes a photograph of the atmosphere. Now, the atmosphere is, as we know, a uh, chaotic system, and people talk about the butterfly effect and things like this. Well, even slight quantum effects are going to change the atmosphere. So, you're not going to see you're not, if there is no state reduction, you're not going to see a particular atmosphere, or you're going to see a, a miserable superposition of all possible atmospheres. It's just going to be one blur. This signal comes back and, and an observer is sitting in front of the screen and finally the signal comes back to him or her of what this uh, space probe is signal. And just at that moment, the consciousness comes in, bloom, it becomes one atmosphere. Does it go all the way back to the signal? I mean, it doesn't make any sense to me at all. Uh, so I just don't see how people, I mean, I can see why they did because quantum mechanics work so well and people talk about observations and von Neumann was no fuel, no fool. <laughs> he was, many people call him the greatest mathematician of, of the 20th century. I don't think I would say that. I think Hermann Weyl was greater, but never mind. Um, he was a very good mathematician. Roger? 
Sorry. Uh, how, how does the retroactive view that you've now put forward and developed in the past few months help with the problems that you had identified earlier, for instance, the heating problem? Yes. Well, you see, there is no heating because it comes, the heating comes about because you have these gas molecules starting to move away from each other. So the superposition is now, they start, it's a superposition of the molecules being here and being here. Now, when that happens, the state changes from this to this. That's a big change. Now that will produce a heat or radiation as in this experiment. But in my scheme, what it does is it traces back to where there was very, very little um, change in, in one and the other. So that the two, mo the molecules were in the same place. I mean, you can, you can have a, a, a beam, well, you can, you can have a, well, there's no heating because it goes back to where they, I mean, they just did, I mean that there, is there, there is no jump. The classical space time evolves continuously, smoothly. And you see, there's the other problem that in the, all these other models where you have a jump there, you violate, well, heating, you violate the conservation of energy. It may be a very, very tiny violation, but that's bad news. It's bad news for general relativity. I suspect that it might be bad news even for celestial dynamics. I, I think the, you can track the motions of planets so accurately now, I mean, you know, the, the motion of the planet Venus was one of the great, uh, the very first great achievement, well, the bending of, I guess, I don't know which way you say, because the, the uh, perihelion of Mercury was, was known before, but the, um, I, don't, I don't remember whether, well, calculations, when was that done? I don't know about the history of it very well. But anyway, that, there were two, the, the perihelion of Mercury, Mercury and the bending of light. But the perihelion of Mercury, uh, I mean, the planetary motions were known extraordinarily precise before that, so that you would be able to distinguish Einstein's from Newton's theory. Now, I should have thought that if there was any change of mass of any significance in a planet, which would be really quite large if this state reduction is taking place all the time, that this would have been shown up by now. Now, I'm just guessing whether that's true. So, so Roger, the, if, if I'm following you, uh, this new view, the retroactive view, maintains the principle of conservation of, of energy, but yes. on pain of just introducing a teleological element to, to our physics. That's correct, yes. But it's a, it's a very slippery kind of tele teleology, which is hard to pin down. You see, I, I have worked hard to make the experiment I mentioned at the end. I had to work hard to think of any experiment where a, a model of the standard kind, I mean, you have an experiment, the first one I had, which I, I uh, it was developed from was one here, which I considered it, but you see, you consider that the photon might be entangled with the object here. So you lose your coherence because it's entangled. But this is so long afterwards and, and the thing is already cohered. So it took me a while to think of an experiment where you could conceivably see the difference. Well, I say the difference between, well, actually see the retroactivity directly. I mean, that's what I'm trying to say. Whereas this particular experiment that I'm putting forward here, it's only in a, in a very, uh, primitive form. I think, I mean, uh, there may be one of, some of these experiments using Bose-Einstein condensates that Yvette Fuentes is collaborating with me on. And I think th there's a lot, of, lot more scope there because you, there are a lot of flexibility. But how you do this experiment with them, I, I don't know yet. The Baumeister one is a little closer to that. You could modify it by putting some more cavities in. You, you put a couple more cavities. You, in his one, you have uh, one, one cavity uh, one cavity here, one cavity here, and you put right. another one. Uh, you, 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 in principle, do it. So I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing how this idea develops and the paper. You've already shown me a draft of a paper that's something like 80 pages long, so I'm curious. I'm going to um, have to introduce that, yes. Right. So let me try to broaden the discussion a little bit. Um, the, by the way, audience members, the organizers have allowed us to go a little bit long on this session, uh, just to make sure we get some of your questions in. But using my prerogative as, as a chair for, the, for a moment, I wanted to ask Stuart if you could just bring us quickly up to speed on the status of uh, empirically testing and intercomparing the different theories, ORCOR, IIT. I know you've got a whole initiative to try to bring some kind of sense to all this 
this zoo of theories? And where does that stand now? Well, Templeton has the project, the Accelerating Research and Consciousness, Templeton World Charity Foundation. And uh, we initially attempted a uh, uh, adversarial collaboration with IIT, but we couldn't come to an agreement. And uh, uh, we're, we're uh, Templeton agreed to fund our uh, attempts to falsify ORCOR without uh, bringing IIT uh, into the mix. I personally don't see how IIT is testable or falsifiable. I know that they are, they're in a project with uh, Global Neuronal Workspace, something about if the MRI is active in the back of the brain, IIT uh, wins. If it's in the front of the brain, Global Workspace wins. But I've seen studies uh, where the activity supposedly correlating with consciousness is sometimes in the front, like with the executive actions, or if you're just watching a film, mindlessly, it's in the back of the brain. So I think consciousness can be in the, first of all, we don't know that MRI uh, correlates with consciousness, it's blood flow. And there are examples where we know it, they, they don't correlate. Uh, so I don't see how uh, uh, activity, bold activity in the front or the back will prove or disprove IIT. I don't think it's, it's testable or falsifiable. I actually don't think it has any, it, it's very general. It applies some uh, uh, nonlinear, I'm not, not even sure what it is. When I heard, first heard about phi, I thought, ah, oh, the golden mean, that's cool. Fibonacci, microtubules, interesting. It's not that, it's something else and I still don't know what it is after all these years. I also have to say that I spent a lot of years with a nonlinear dynamicist, very good friend of mine, Alwyn Scott, who wrote Stairway to the Mind and started the CNLS at Los Alamos and went to a lot of chaos meetings up there and whatnot and tried to apply nonlinear dynamics to consciousness and microtubule activities and it just didn't seem to do anything for it. And then uh, I read Roger's book and met Roger and decided that the quantum approach was much better. So um, uh, IIT's main, main claim to fame seems to be that they explain that the, uh, the way the cerebellum is wired up, uh, it doesn't have enough phi, which is why the cerebellum isn't conscious, but the cerebellum doesn't have pyramidal cells. I think uh, consciousness occurs in pyramidal cells primarily. It can uh, occur in any um, microtubule uh, bearing uh, material or, or anything else really if it's proto-conscious. Um, but uh, uh, you don't need to invoke uh, you know, how the cerebellum is wired up if, if, if you need uh, uh, pyramidal cells. So um, uh, for a while, um, uh, they were trying to say that uh, if we could show uh, quantum vibrations in microtubules, uh, that, uh, that uh, uh, IIT would, phi would apply to that. And I said, okay, well, let's do it. And then we'll see which, uh, which applies better, uh, ORCOR or IIT. And then they backed out. They didn't, they, I called their bluff and they didn't go for it. So uh, we're going on our own. We have funding to do, uh, and I'm not involved in the experiments. Roger's not involved. It's being done by experts who are basically neutral. Uh, in fact, uh, some of them are, are, are skeptical uh, of, of what we say. So we'll see. And we're, you know, I, as I said in the title of my talk, uh, it would be very easy to falsify work OR at least or by showing that there's no, none of these quantum vibrations in the microtubules as our, mo as our computer modeling study uh, showed. Basically, we're trying to do that computer modeling sh that I, I had a blitz through too fast, uh, do it experimentally to find these quantum vibrations in microtubules in the terahertz. And if they're there at room temperature or biological temperature, then see if they go away with anesthesia proportional to the anesthetic potency. I think that would be a very strong uh, claim, certainly stronger than any other theory of consciousness yet proposed, but I have no idea how to disprove IIT. Great, so looking at some of the questions that are coming in, there's actually a common theme has developed in a few of the questions between your talk and Peter and Hartman's talk, and maybe actually I'll pose this question to Peter and Hartman therefore, and that is the, the role that you're giving to pleasure seeking as opposed to other uh, evolutionary ad adaptive advantages, for example, or subjectivity. So can you flesh out a little bit why you give pleasure this central role? Peter, uh, Hartman or me? Uh, um, maybe, maybe Hartman and then Peter can chime in and then Stu, you too. Yeah, so we definitely didn't want to propose a pure pleasure seeking <laughs> robot. Um, it's actually both ways. Um, what pleasure and displeasure um, or we meant to say it is a good place to start um, 
when you try to reconcile the first person perspective and third person perspective, as I said, it's a good place to start where these perspectives are correlated. And it seems like, um, let me follow Antonio Damasio's work, um, who points this out uh, very eloquently, that feelings are basically about checking in how the homeostasis is doing. And if your homeostasis is doing well, then you seem to be in a good um, state, it feels good. And if your homeostasis is uh, threatened or becoming instable, then it feels unpleasant. So it's this correlation. It's not just about pleasure, it's about uh, both signs. Peter, did you want to chime in as well? Yeah, yeah, yeah I mean, uh, inevitably, I suppose, as an investor, I look at this with a, a slightly more commercial angle. So for me, um, you know, trying to sort of tease that out. And I think what's interesting for me is the where we got to right at the end, which is what happens when you integrate this homeostatic engine that works in the way that Harvard just describes with a learner. And because I think that is where I see commercial application for this. It, as, as we said, it has, um, it has ethical questions uh, that would need to be navigated very carefully, but I think it's a really interesting uh, you know, point to leave the audience with, which is, would you, you know, would you rather have the best AI, and we think that one integrated with a homeostatic engine is that, or would you want to have one that you can control and I think that's a really kind of a nuanced ethical question, but it's also, um, you know, highly commercially relevant to a lot of the work that's being done in AI right now. So Stuart, do you see this tying into your own, that big paper you did a few years ago on pleasure seeking as an essential evolutionary driver? Yeah, I've never been uh, totally happy with the idea of, of evolution. Oh, uh, Stuart, can you turn up your uh, volume? Turn it what? Oh, there, now I can hear you. I've never been totally happy with the idea of uh, evolution and uh, gene survival, that, that, that everything we do is to promote our genes. Uh, if you look, any organism in a lab uh, on up to us humans uh, acts uh, to optimize pleasure in some way, certainly reward in, a, in, a, in, in rats or any experiment you want to do. And then we learn to you know, uh, delay our gratification and it's not all hedonism or pleasure, but basically we're here now to because we're pursuing our profession and we enjoy it. And in some way, we're getting we're getting some pleasure out of it or some gratification. So all we do, you know, it, it doesn't need to be hedonistic. It could be altruistic. It could be spiritual. It could be, uh, you know, it, it's better to give than to receive. So I, I, it's not a hedonistic approach, but it, it certainly I think it certainly started out that way. And when I realized that Roger's objective reduction with these organic molecules uh, could have, could have, uh, did, should have preceded the origin of life, you know, uh, and the origin of life is still somewhat of a mystery, still a mystery. And uh, if it was, uh, you know, simple pleasure or avoidance of displeasure could have been the spark, sparks uh, that originated life and just kept on going as the motivation for the uh, development and assembly of organisms into more and more complex uh, entities to optimize pleasure in various ways. So um, I like the uh, the quantum pleasure principle idea, and uh, uh, it's uh, you know I, I'm kind of, I've kind of uh, uh, become used to being uh, an outlier in in science uh, in many ways. So you know let's just add evolution to the mix. But um, and I'm not sure how Roger feels about that. So I, I, he certainly. I mean, I'm using his ideas of OR in the, in the uh, you know, early or mid-universe uh, uh, to, to promote uh, life and evolution. But um, it, it's logical to me. It makes a lot more sense than uh, gene survival. And, you know, genes don't feel or think as far as we know. If they do, then, then maybe that's another case. But uh, uh, I think it's all about optimizing uh, pleasure and avoiding displeasure. Wonderful. Thanks. So Ani, are you, are you there? You've dropped off my screen here, but we do have a number of audience questions for you. I hope he hasn't gone to bed. I know it's in the middle of the night for him. <laughs> Sleep me. So Ani, if you come back in, I will, I will pose these questions. People are dying to know more about quantum cloaking. Um, going back to, um, to Peter and, and Hartmut, a question came in about, well, essentially asking how this works in collective systems, how, for instance, wh whether markets could actually exhibit some of these 
feelings or, or feedback loops that you're describing, homeostatic feedback loops you're describing? Is, is this applied to biological organisms and AI systems, or is it a more general feature of the world, the kind of approach you're taking? Peter? <laughs> Sorry, go for a moment. Yeah, maybe um, you know, I, I gave sort of this um, explanation of why we think a conscious experience is a limited observable. It's uh, observable strictly in the Gedanken experiment of two clones. Um, and I have always thought, okay, between us and the robots, the um, the, on animat this gulf is too big we are too different even though we can think of this cheesy move of giving it self-reporting abilities via word embeddings but i always thought if there would be a society of um, or multiple animats that could interact with each other then for them they become observable their conscious state um, becomes observable relative to each other and can we exploit this somehow? Um, but I have to admit, I never got this to work as of now. So yeah, it would be very interesting to think of this animat we proposed in a group setting. So you have multiple AIs interacting with each other. What happens then? Um, but as of today, I don't have a good answer for that. I would just add that I think the, the principle that we were trying to embody there was um, the, the well-known um, it, it, it takes one to know one, uh, which we thought, you know, was, was an interesting place to start. And, and we actually sort of felt that that was much easier to model between, I mean, the model we had in our minds was a, you know, a parent and child, uh, you know, very often the expression on a child's face will tell a parent quite a lot about what that child, the, the conscious experience that, that child is having. Um, so I think we were uh, we were thinking in a, very, in a, in a relatively limited, uh, you know, one-to-one -one rather than uh, many-to-many. -many. Very good, thanks. So, Roger, the top trending question on the Q&A session right now actually goes back to some of the Emperor's uh, new mind <laughs> arguments about uh, yeah. kind of a Gödelian argument. Yes. And the question is whether the same <laughs> Gödelian restriction on logical mathematical systems also applies to science as a whole, whether science as a whole is somehow restricted or its methods are restricted in this kind of self-referential way. Do you have any thoughts on that? I don't know of any theorem to do with that. I mean, the thing about the Gödel theorem is it's a theorem. <laughs> and it really does show you that uh, we don't, uh, well, I mean, people don't think about it this way, but, but it's, I mean, people, I thought, I'm glad to hear people still worrying about it because <laughs> um, it's, it's something which you can't explain simply by an AI system, as far as I can see. I mean, um, it's the question of understanding. I always like to phrase it that way, that what it is that, I mean, consciousness does all sorts of things. I mean, clearly, I mean, people talk about pain and pleasure and, uh, and that sort of thing. And, uh, but the main thing that I could say anything about I mean, I can't quite see why you could say something enjoys itself and, and uh, worry about whether you can make a theory out of that. But, but what you can say is understanding of mathematical truth. Now, you may say that's a very limited activity, but if in that limited activity, you could see that there is something non-computational going on, then it seems to me that's a serious argument, even though, uh, well, I've been worried about the people have forgotten the argument, but the argument is 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 pretty strong, um, especially in the, in the context of evolution. I mean, you you could see that, okay, the Gödel theorem is pretty sophisticated, or the Goodstein theorem, which I often give in talks, is. Uh, I mean, you can understand what the theorem is, and you can even see sort of why it's true for the number four, for example. But how is it that the understanding that this thing is true came about when it's so far from, from natural selection of phenomena? So it obviously was not specifically selected for. That is to say, an algorithm for doing very sophisticated mathematics was not naturally selected for. What was naturally selected for was the general quality of understanding. And that's the ability, if you like, to stand back and think about what you were thinking about and things like that. 
And in Gödel's theorem, it's very much that sort of a thing. You stand back and think about what you were thinking about. I and mean, that's, that's, that's exactly, you were trying to think about what somebody else would think about something. And you can see in behavior, I mean, one of the examples I would like to quote is this, the, the African hunting dogs and how they are, they, you can see them dividing themselves into two groups. One group go and hide just where the, the pass over the, the river has to be and the other one go and chase the antelopes there and then they pounce on them. I mean, they must have com been communicating with themselves in some way to work out that strategy. Okay, that's not solving the Gödel problem or something, but that's understanding of some kind. And that, I can well believe, goes way, way down in, 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 in the animal kingdom, not just humans. And that quality, okay, it's been developed very greatly in, in human thinking, and sure, but it's something which has been there a long time, and it has been naturally selected for. And what consciousness is doing in this particular respect is giving us the quality of understanding. That does other things too. Um, Do you think that the difficulties we have in science, at least in theoretical physics, of understanding the measurement problem or other great questions of our age? The question also... is beyond this, I suppose. That was, I, I rather lost the question in rambling in my way. No, but yeah, the question is, is there some limit to our understanding in some sense of physics? I don't quite see where there should be. And I don't know of any sort of Gödel type theorem that says you can't have that. Okay, you can't have a theory which tells us what I'm going to do next and then I'm do something else. I mean, sure, yeah, you have that kind of limitation. So it can't be a theory where you could um, make a computer work out what I'm going to do in 10 minutes and tell me what the answer is before 10 minutes. And that's how I'm damn well not going to do it. So you can see you've got, you, you've got to evolve, avoid that kind of paradox. And clearly you've got to avoid that kind of paradox with the retroactive scheme, which I'm putting forward. So, so that's absolutely clear. So um, uh, that's the thing which is, but it's not the same as, I think the question was worrying about whether a limit ultimately to the, to the development of physics. I don't see why there should be. It may be, you know, too complicated to work things out or it may be difficult in other, some other sense to work it out. But I don't see why in principle one shouldn't get to the root of it all. We're not there yet, I'm no way from it. But. Well, those of us trained in physics will be relieved to hear that because that's as much <laughs> our life's work is. Yes. So, so Stuart, there's been a couple questions that, um, actually there's been a number of questions about some of the nitty gritty of orco arm microtubules. But let me just pick one of them as a representative question, which is memory. So can you elaborate for a couple minutes on how memory works because this is, I think you're proposing, if I'm following, a pretty radical shift in neuroscience of memory. Yes, uh, the, the uh, standard idea is synaptic plasticity, synaptic strength. You have a neural network and the strength of particular synapses in the network will channel information activity through the network in a particular way. And synaptic strengths and uh, the famous long-term potentiation experiments, uh, Bliss and O'Keefe and, and those guys, um, uh, uh, showed that uh, a high frequency uh, input causes a prolonged uh, sensitization of that synapse uh, and uh, Donald Hebb and, and all that. So that's, that's pretty standard dogma. The problem with that is that the membrane proteins at the synapses, the, uh, both on the postsynaptic side, the receptors and the, and the GTP, uh, cyclic uh, uh, G proteins and all that, and on the uh, release side, uh, are transient and only last hours to days and uh, memories can last lifetimes. So these proteins have to be replenished. And how are they replenished? Well, by the microtubules uh, with the motor proteins carrying those things along as I showed in one of those early slides. Um, so um, the microtubules are involved in, in memory, but most people would still say it's in the synaptic strength, uh, but that's too short. Now, what we showed in our paper uh, with the CAMK2, Travis, uh, Jack Jasinski and I, was that CAMK2, which is uh, uh, not well understood, this hexagonal enzyme, and it is involved in memory, can imprint up to six bits of information per CAMK2. And with every synaptic influx, there's hundreds, if not thousands, of these CAMK2s that spread all over the, the neuron, the, the dendrite uh, tree, dendritic tree. So, uh, and the phosphorylation fits. So, um, it, I think it's a, it's a valid mechanism, and uh, um, uh, we get a lot of hits on our, our paper, but it hasn't made a dent in neuroscience. 
uh, because everybody's so entrenched, uh, just like everybody's so entrenched in neurons being the fundamental units of information processing in the brain, and we know that can't be right. But when you think about a single cell, like a paramecium or even an amoeba that can solve problems, a paramecium swims around, finds a mate, can learn, all these things. It doesn't have any, it's not part of a network, it's one cell. All those creatures use their microtubules. So would our microtubules be sitting around acting as bony skeletal support and not taking advantage of their information processing abilities? I don't think so. And we need the, we need the capacity for memory storage. And uh, each tubulin can be uh, modified in so many different ways, post-translational modifications, phosphorylation, uh, binding of, uh, of, of uh, various things, so that each tubulin can have, let's just say, 10 states. So you've got 10 to the ninth raised to the 10th power of possible states per neuron. So the capacity of memory storage uh, at that level is enormous. Then the problem is, well, how does it relate globally? And so you need entanglement, you need something quantum so that memory is distributed. And we know memory is distributed anyway through Lashley and Prebum and so forth. So um, I think it's a logical uh, proposal. Uh, I'm somewhat dismayed that it hasn't been picked up on because uh, memory is still a mystery. And uh, the whole thing with Alzheimer's and, and memory loss, uh, sh people should be looking at the microtubules. And uh, in fact, we've proposed using ultrasound. Ultrasound, uh, uh, this, this study yesterday, and uh, Sasha Bistritsky mentioned a couple of different mechanisms. He said, well, Stewart has his own ideas. Well, my idea is that the ultrasound acts on microtubules because they have megahertz uh, vibrational frequencies. And we actually have some preliminary data on that we've, we've never uh, published. And, uh, but um, I, I think uh, that's a way of addressing memory issues and Alzheimer's and, and other uh, neurological disorders is, is by approaching the microtubules, not just working on receptors that act on uh, membrane proteins. Wonderful, thank you. So um, part of what, we've had a few questions that are in a very much like, tell me about X uh, perspective. So let me kind of pack those together. Can you give us just a quick rundown of where some of your experiments, to the extent you can tell us where your experiments in progress stand? What's the next milestone we can look forward to now that supremacy has been achieved? Just a quick status report. <laughs> yeah, so this would, my day job, I should say, is um, not about uh, building a conscious or feeling any mats. <laughs> my day job is um, concerned with building a large error corrected uh, quantum computer and finding uh, scientifically or commercially relevant applications for it. And um, for those who are interested, um, we host an um, annual event, it's called the Quantum Summer Symposium. And the uh, video of the talks just went online. So there is actually a half hour talk as if somebody wants to know what, where does the Quantum AI lab at Google stand today and uh, what is our roadmap going forward. There's a talk that people can look at, um, but I can maybe highlight um, where we want to go. So we indeed um, spent significant time fleshing out um, a roadmap. And the anchor points are, we believe it will take us about 10 years. We joke it will be before the end of the decade, <laughs> to allude to this Kennedy quote, that we have uh, this error corrected machine um, ready. And there's a, a sequence of technical milestones leading up to it. Our next technical milestone is to demonstrate that quantum error correction can work in principle. It has never been shown that um, let's say you build a little grid of qubits, let's say three by three uh, qubits or five by five qubits, and then you surround them with these measure qubits that do the roundabout parity measurements that I uh, talked about. So what you need to see is if I have, let's say a five by five grid of data qubits relative to a three by three grid, then the logical error rate needs to come down. This has never been shown. And this is our next milestone. So we hope um, to demonstrate uh, that. And then, yeah, there's more milestones and leading up um, all the way to the one million machine, but I stop here. Can I, can I just add, George, to, to that? Again, again, from a, a layman or a, or a more sort of commercial um, perspective, I, I said during our talk, you know, what excites me about what uh, Hartman and his team are building there are these machines that, um, solve problems the way nature solves problems. We would call it biomimicry, I guess. And um, in the the commercial, uh, the the most likely commercial applications of that could potentially be in things like um, quantum chemistry, 
Um, and, you know, for me, if we're starting to be able to build artificial trees that take uh, carbon dioxide out of the air and turn it into oxygen, that feels to me like a, you know, a good thing for humanity, obviously, and a, you know, a proper commercial application of relatively, um, uh, you know, early generation um, quantum machines. Wonderful, thank you. So, um, Roger, you have a couple of hundred audience members out here. I don't know what the latest count, 198 online. <laughs> and maybe 197 of them are still trying to get their minds, including myself, around the retroactive ideas yeah. that you have. So one question came up that may help us zero in on this is whether it would help understand the delayed choice experiment or some of these other experiments, quantum steering, uh, into the past that might, how does your view bear on those, those classic experiments? Well, I'd forgotten them when I was, <laughs> no, I don't think really, because I, I don't think the multiple delayed choice, is that what you were referring to? There was a thing called That's the right. delay. Yes. It's a Wheeler type of experiment. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I, don't, I never could quite see why that was a problem, <laughs> but maybe because the, the choice is made, it's not made earlier. I think it was a way of looking at quantum mechanics, which isn't mine, but I'd have to be reminded what it is again, because I, I remember thinking that I didn't quite see why it was a problem. Um, it's it's to, to do whether something is a position state or, or, or is, it, is it an interference thing? And, and you... well, I think the idea is that between the state preparation, so after state preparation, but before measurement, yeah, sure. the decision is made that slits are opened or closed, for example, they're not. So, yeah. Clearly, the state preparation can't be responsible then for what the output is. That's right. I mean, this, yeah. I mean, the state is something or other, um, and whether you choose to close the state. I mean, suppose it, there's a photon coming along and it doesn't know whether you've chosen to open the slit or not. Well, that photon has a state which is spread out. It's not localized. Sure. So only part of it goes through the slit. So a lot of it gets lost. But the part which goes through the slit is localized there. It's not as though it's decided beforehand that it's going to go through the slit or something. I didn't quite under. I think I never quite got the hang of the of what the problem was. Um, let, let me um then channel <laughs> the, the 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 audience members' question in a slightly different direction. There have been other proposals yeah. by Ken Wharton, Hugh Price, and others for a retrocausal interpretation of a Bell experiment that the correlation might reflect a backward in time. Yes, or John, uh, John Kramer. Ruth Kastner. Uh, yeah, Yakir did that kind of thing. Does your view uh, relate to that? I was well, you see, when I was running my notes, I was perfectly well. I was going to put Aronoff's and all that stuff into, into the model and thinking of it sort of, and then I realized it was different. As far as I can see, I mean, they have two a forward propagating and a backward propagating wave function. And so that when you, you have a measurement here and then a measurement here, I'm, here and here means in time, earlier and then later. And this measurement re reduces the wave function to, to a reduced state here. But then there's a corresponding wave function which is reduced by the later measurement and they come back. And it's quite useful to consider those two wave functions together because you can look at scalar products and so on. And there are these Weidmann uh, experiments um, which are very complicated and you have little things going on in the middle and so on. It, it helps you to understand some of those um, situations. I don't think it's the same thing is what I'm saying because they tend not to be, I don't know what a Haranov's view is on, on the reduction of the state. I know I've talked to him about it, but I can't, I can't uh, um, Lev Weidman I've talked to certainly about this. Well, they, they tend to be many worlds type of view. Well, for me, what, a key message though is independent of the specifics that yeah. your proposal, which will strike a lot of people as just crazy. Oh yeah, it has to be crazy. <laughs> but, but it's very much in keeping. It's, it's, it's something a lot of people have thought about and yeah. it's not crazy. It's really, it's just objectively not a crazy idea. And I'm very excited to see how you develop it. When I say it's crazy, I mean, it's, it's unlike our current thinking. Well, you see, my cosmological model is crazy too, but then we seem to see confirmations of that. Um, this is crazier, but that doesn't mean it's wrong. 
it's just when I say it's crazy, I mean, you know, quantum mechanics is crazy. <laughs> Even the Earth moving around the sun is probably pretty crazy, isn't it? <laughs> It's, it's crazy, it's just unfamiliarity, I suppose. Yeah, and when you get used to the idea, I mean, even, the, yeah, that the Earth is rotating and not the sun moving around it, it's pretty crazy. Because you can okay, see so it. so I need yeah. to give a final, final word to... So, to Roger's credit, I would say it's oh. experimentally testable and hence it's oh, science. Yes, yes. You testable. know, that just, and that's what excites me about OCRR in general, that yes. we, it can be tested. It's, it's not just floating off in the unempirical clouds. But certainly the retroactive, as the, the last experiment I, I mentioned rather quickly, in some form is, is testable. I mean, if that's certainly in theory testable, whether you could make it a practical one. I think it probably is not so far from the Barmist experiment, that you just put a few more cavities in the experiment. It would probably take another <laughs> five years to do it or something. But I can't quite see why you couldn't modify it to, to, to test it in this way. Whether you could do make Bose-Einstein condensates, that's really exciting. I, I like to think more about those um, because they're much more flexible. You see, you can do all sorts of things. Um, so, Stuart, um, I'm passing the, the baton to you. I understand that you have an announcement to make for the group, and then we can all break and go get some lunch or dinner or whatever it is in our time zone. Well, th thank you, George. And I'll hand it back to you. And I, I basically wanted to thank you and the other uh, uh, speakers. I thought this was a great session. Uh, this is my last uh, time uh, on screen uh, for this conference, so I want to thank all the speakers, all the participants. I want to particularly thank uh, the guys from Commotion Studios who handle our AV and tech stuff. And I want to thank uh, Abby Behar Montefiore, who is Wonder Woman, and uh, she and Commotion, uh, uh, I gave them, in retrospect, unreasonable expectations. Uh, and yet they uh, pretty much, they met them. We've had a few glitches, but uh, generally it's run uh, very well. And thanks especially to Abby. She's always trustworthy. She's always reliable. She always comes through. And the same can be said of commotion. So thanks to all. And I'll send it back to you to say goodbye. And thanks. Good seeing all my friends out there. Good seeing you guys. Likewise. It's been a pleasure. And just a quick note, um, assuming we meet in person next year, how does the cycling work? Where will we be probably? Uh, we'll be in, back in, in Tucson in Ventana if the pandemic is over. In April of uh, 22, I forget the exact dates, uh, 21, we're up in the air. We've had a couple of uh, proposals uh, to have the conference in Europe, but I think it's too early to tell right now. Um, oh, here we go. Save the date, April 18th through 23rd, 2022. So uh, a little less than two years from now. Uh, and uh, next year, you know, to keep the streak alive, it's, it usually would be in a, a, a European site. Uh, but that's kind of up in the air right now. Uh, we'll, we'll just have to see what happens. We'd like to keep the streak going. Maybe we'll do it again online. Uh, but I don't know at this point. But thanks for asking. And thanks, you for put, putting together. I remember sitting in your living room when the whole Kirkland, Washington thing began to happen. And we wondered whether the conference would go forward. Yeah, and your physics meeting had gotten canceled. And, and that you were at the last minute. Yeah. Yeah. And that was all. Yeah, it was all fresh and new. And uh and you were going going, uh, going back to your home, New Jersey, was it? And yeah, it was, I had to get on a plane. It was it was it was a it was lot scary, of COVID but... going on there too. So yeah. uh, I'm glad you're healthy, and I hope that you and uh, your family and everyone else. Thanks else so much. Is, and I, that goes for everybody, of course. So I'd like to thank you, Roger, Peter, Hartmut, Ani. I think is it's three or four in the morning for him. He's probably asleep. And he's, a, he's a, not a late night person. So thanks to all the panelists for a wonderful panel. And thanks to the 200 or whatever number of people uh, who've been on the chat line, very active. I apologize for not getting to all your questions. Um, please do pose them one-on-one -on -one to the to speakers. I think if this, if I may, the, the chat line keeps going. Uh, so people can keep uh, sending them in if I'm not mistaken. And in principle, we can answer them, but I'm so, not sure about it. Chat away, uh, whether people can get to it, it's, 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 you know, we're a limited bandwidth, so we'll do what we can. Thank you again. And the conference is by no means over. We've got to talk, when is it coming up? Soon, right? Half an hour, we have a Nobel laureate, and then we have a closing session on the origin of EEG with three experts, and then we have uh, concurrent sessions, and then we have uh, conscious, consciousness tonight with the poetry slam and other things uh, with Baba. So uh, thank you all for tuning in. And Likewise. See everyone later. Ciao. Bye-bye. Thanks. Bye. Bye-bye. Yep. It was a nice session.